Good evening, everyone, uh, and good afternoon. I'm New York City Council Member Andy King. I represent the 12th District. I want to welcome everyone to the first uh, Juvenile Justice Committee that I am chairing. I'm honored and pleasure to have an opportunity to lead this session's conversation when it comes to juvenile justice. As a member and a caseworker for the City of New York, ACS worker, I understand the challenges that families go through each and every day in maintaining their youth, and the city has taken on the mantle of being partners with our families in the City of New York to provide safety, development, and as someone say, um, rehabilitation to some of our young people who are in need of help. Um, as I said, this committee is very um, responsible, very important and responsible of making sure that young people are involved in the justices are treated in a manner that will give them the best opportunity to move forward in a positive path. This is our first hearing of the new legislation session, and it will be a general conversation about what the juvenile system is, what its responsibility is, and just getting a flavor of what we do and how we do and when we do it, and when we do it right, we flaw it, and when we do it wrong, figure out uh, solutions to correct it. So I'm looking forward to those conversations. We do understand that there are a number of strengths and weaknesses in the system, and that's the conversation that we're looking forward to engage and encounter. Um, I believe that by the time a young person encounters the justice system, they've already dealt with a host of challenges in life, and today I'm hoping to learn more about the programs being offered and the efforts that are being made to encourage positive de development amongst young people who come before you. Today's conversation is especially important as we prepare for the implementation of Raise the Age. And as we move forward in this new phase of juvenile justice system, I'm looking forward to the opportunity that we'll have to learn from the wisdom of past mistakes. But as this new population comes in from Raise the Age, I know it's gonna bring a set of new challenges for us all, and I don't want us to rush into anything that will not be, that, that we cannot sustain because Albany passed these rules down on us. I want us to make sure whatever we do in the city makes sense and is stable to making sure that our young people who enter into the system, at the end of the day, when they walk out of the system, they can be positive, productive adults. So we have a lot to talk about, and I'm encouraged by all of us who are here today who are gonna testify and drop their expertise onto the record so we can figure out how do we continue to be partners, not just adversaries, but being partners in developing a system that's designed to provide quality service to our young people who are in need. Um, so again, I wanna thank each and every one of you who are here, the administration as well as the public and our union brothers and sisters who sit before us and all the advocates. Um, I wanna say I'm joined today by my colleague um, and I wanna thank him, Council Member Mark Levine from Manhattan for joining me today as well as the committee council, Beth, I wanna say thank you for her and, and everyone I've met in order to organize and prepare for today's conversation and how we wanna look at moving forward throughout, th throughout this whole session. So as I said to Beth, and I want us to make sure that as we continue to move forward today, that we move from day one to understanding the system and build a path of where we wanna see ourselves end up at the end of the conversation. So again, I wanna thank each and every one of you here today and we're gonna look forward to hearing from the administration right now. So if I, if council may swear in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and answer honestly to council member questions? You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair King, uh, Mr. Levine, and members of the Committee of Juvenile Justice. I'm Felipe Franco, Deputy Commissioner of Division of Youth and Family Justice, DYFJ, with me, with the Administration for Children's Services. With me today are Sarah Hemeter, Associate Commissioner for Community-Based Alternatives, um, Stephanie Prusak, Associate Commissioner for Detention Services, and John Dixon, Associate Commissioner for Close to Home. On behalf of David Hansen, I would like to thank Chair King for joining us on our visit to the Close to Home residents in the Bronx earlier this month. We look forward to hosting more visits for you and the entire Juvenile Justice Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding ACS continuum of juvenile justice services and programming. The Division of Youth and Family Justice oversees services and programs for youth at every stage of the juvenile justice process and works to promote public safety and improve the life of young people, families, and communities by providing treatment, safe and secure custodial care, responsive health care, effective reentry services, and promo promoting educational achievement. Our continuum includes community-based preventive services for youth who are at risk of delinquency. 
as well as their families. In addition, we provide detention services to youth who are arrested and waiting for court resolution. Since, 2000, since 2012, with Governor Cuomo's enactment of Close to Home, we have been providing residential services for all youth placed with, with New York City as adjudicated juvenile delinquents, as well as aftercare service, services upon their return to the community. First and foremost, we aim to divert youth from the juvenile justice system. As a city, it is imperative that we all work to arm our youth with the tools and the support they need to become successful adults. The number of young people entering the juvenile justice system has continued to decline over the last several years. In 2010, 5,084 young people were admitted to detention for the calendar year. Admissions to detention have decreased significantly year after year, dropping to just 1,979 total admissions in the calendar, calendar year 2017. We think this is attributable to smart policing, lower juvenile arrests across the city, and the intensive preventive services that ACS and other partner agencies provide to prevent young people from ever entering the system in the first place. Community-based alternatives. We know that the best way to intervene in the life of young people is to treat the whole family. ACS Family Assessment Program, FAP, is available to families with youth up to age 18 and supports parents and guardians who are struggling to address difficult teenage behaviors. FAP offers intensive in-home therapeutic services that are designed to improve family functioning and avoid delinquency. ACS also runs the Juvenile Justice Initiative in partnership with the Department of Probation, which is the largest alternative to placement program in the city. JJI serves youth who have been adjudicated in family court and provides intensive services to these youth to keep them in their communities and with their families. Both FAP and JJI help parents develop skills to support their children, enforce limits, and steer them toward positive activities. The vast majority of young people in the juvenile justice system, as high as 90%, regardless of gender, have experienced some sort of trauma. We know that there is a close correlation between child maltreatment and future delinquency, and so we have partnered with, the, with multiple stakeholders to support children who have experienced abuse and neglect with the goal of preventing their entry into the juvenile justice system. In addition to expanding and strengthening programs to reduce the number of young people entering the foster care and juvenile justice systems, ACS is also committed to investing in work that focuses specifically on dually involved youth, such as the crossover youth practice model, which was developed by the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University. The term crossover youth describes a young person who enters the justice system while involved in the child welfare system. These young people essentially cross over from the child welfare system into the juvenile justice system. ACS offers a broad range of services to help prevent children with child welfare involvement from entering the juvenile and the criminal justice system. The crossover youth practice model, CYPM, is a multi-agency approach that seeks to improve outcomes for young people who are involve, involved in both systems. ACS provides secure and non-secure detention, services for youth who have been arrested and are waiting for judges to hear their case in court. The Division of Youth and Family Justice currently operates two secure detention facilities, Crossroads in Brooklyn and Horizons in the Bronx and oversees eight non-for-profit provider agency operated non-secure detention group homes across New York City. Secure detention has, has the most restrictive security features and is typically reserved for youth who pose the highest risk or have been accused of committing serious offenses. Young people housed in our secure detention facilities receive on-site health, mental health, dental services, recreational activities, and case management. Education is provided on-site throughout the Department of Education District 79 Passages Academy. Youth in NSD receive health, mental health, recreational and case management services in a less restrictive residential setting than the secure detention sites. 
In non-secure detention, young people are able to leave their residences under strict staff supervision to attend school, recreational activities, and appointments. The Department of Education provides instruction for all non-secure detention youth at two Passages Academy sites, Belmont in Brooklyn and Bronx Hope in the Bronx. We also contract and partner with the New York City Health and Hospitals, Bellevue Hospital, to provide psychiatric and psychological services to further support the mental health needs of youth, youth in detention. Throughout this partnership, the Division of Youth and Family Justice has implemented trauma-informed screening and care in our secure detention facilities, making us one of the first secure detention systems in the country to implement trauma-informed practices. Bellevue has trained all secure detention staff in dealing with the various types of trauma that impact youth in our care, which increases the staff ability to identify trauma exposure and work with traumatized youth and reduce secondary trauma issues among staff. Close to home is a juvenile justice reform that has been that has allowed New York City youth who have been adjudicated juvenile delinquents to be placed in residential care with ACS near their home communities. Before close to home, New York City children were placed in large institution, institutions located upstate, hundreds of miles away from their families and home communities. The distance, of, the distance to these facilities often, often hinder families from visiting and, preventing, and prevented meaningful family engagement. School credits earned while in placement in the upstate facilities were not transferred to the DOE school system. So young people returning to their home schools significant so young people returning to their home schools significantly behind in credits needed for need, needed for academic advancement and created a disincentive for many youth to continue attending schools after their release. Close to home affords young people and their families the ability to participate in meaningful treatment together. Young people in close to home receive education from the New York City Department of Education and continue to accrue credit to our academic achievement while in placement. Since its beginning in 2012, the administration and the administration operation of Close to Home has steadily improved and has positioned the city as a national model for juvenile justice reform. Close to Home has succeeded in improving outcomes for youth. Data in our recently issued Close to Home report for the fiscal year 2016-17 we have been shared with you today show that young people are going to school, getting good grades, pass, passing region exams. In many cases, young people are more engaged in school while in close to home placement than they were previously. In addition, they are receiving counseling and supporting services to help them manage underlying trauma and issues that contributed to their involvement in the juvenile justice system in the first place. A recent independent report on close to home released by the Center for Children Law and Policy with the support from the NE Casey Foundation found similar improvements improvement and cites close to home as a national reform model from which other jurisdictions across the country can learn. Involvement in close to home includes both a stay in residential placement and a term of supervised aftercare as youth transition from placement back into their home communities. ACS currently partners with seven non-for-profit agencies to deliver strength-based placement programs in 24 non-secure placement residence, NSP, locate, located in or near New York City. All seven providers have experience in serving juvenile justice populations, and each program offers structured residential care in a small, supervised, home-like environment. All non-secure programs require schedules that are des des designed to ensure participation in programs while preserving the safety and security of youth, staff, and the surrounding community. Young people in non-secure placement while under strict staff supervision are also able to leave the residences to attend school and medical appointments and may earn the privilege to attend certain outside recreational activities. Limited secure placement, which opened in December of 2015, currently has programs operating at four sites, one in the Bronx, two in Dobbs Ferry, and one in Queens. Unlike NSP, all programming and services are provided to young people on site, including medical, dental, psychiatric, and education. 
limit the secure placement residences, also future ad additional security features, such as perimeter fencing, closed security TV monitoring, and door locking mechanisms. Most of our young people return to their home communities on aftercare following their close to home residential placement. Families and youth receive intensive support and accountability from their assigned ACS worker and aftercare resources. Planning for reentry to the community begins while the youth is in residential placement in order to put in place the supports necessary to meet the needs of youth and their families and reduce the risk of reoffending. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss ACS Continuum of Juvenile Justice Services and Programming for Youth in New York City. The Division of Youth and Family Justice provides age and developmentally appropriate services that are tailored to the youth's specific needs and risk, as well as the support families need to assist in their children's progress and prevent further juvenile um, system involvement. The importance of this developmental approach is underscored as the city works to implement Race to Age and prepares to receive 16 and 17 year olds in the juvenile justice system. Given the remarkable success of Close to Home since its beginning in 2012, and the, and the search of young people who will need to be placed in Close to Home and one once raised the age is implemented, the state should be expanding its commitment to Close to Home this year. Instead, it's against this backdrop that Governor Cuomo proposes to eliminate all state funding for Close to Home. I respectfully ask you, you and everyone in this room to join us in urging the state to appropriately fund close to home and not to abandon these life-changing juvenile justice reform efforts. As you are aware, extens extensive planning is on the way to prepare for the implementation of the initial requirements of Race to Age by October 1, 2018. A citywide steering committee shared by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and including representatives from multiple agencies, including ACS, NYPD, Department of Education, Department of Corrections, Department of Probation, Department of Design and Construction, Office of Management and Budget, and the Law Department, and the State Office of Court Administration have been working to guide the overall citywide planning effort. We have embraced the opportunity to conceptualize alternatives to detention and placement that are age appropriate and gender responsive and that address the current gap for youth without a permanency resource. We have also been working closely with our partners in the Department of Education to plan for enhanced career and technical education programming for youth in detention close to home and in the community. While all of this, is, all of this extensive plan is underway, the Division of Youth and Family Justice continues to operate a safe and secure juvenile justice system for New York City's youth. We view Raise the Age as an opportunity to strengthen the foundations of our existing system and continue to improve our practice, support our staff, and fortify safety across the entire continuum. With Raise the Age, we will need to further adapt our services and programming within our community, detention, and placement programs to meet the needs of an older youth population. The city projects cost of the cost of raised to age to be approximately $200 million, cost, cost which the governor budget does not cover. As you in, might imagine, this is a significant undertaking. The Division of Youth and Family Justice has had a long and transparent relationship with the Juvenile Justice Committee of the City Council, and we intend to maintain that transparency throughout this planning process as well as the phases of the raised to age implementation. Given the very aggressive timeline for implementation of this important legislation, we will need to be prepared for the inevitable challenge that will very likely on we encounter as we move forward to expand our juvenile justice system to include these new youth. We will continue to seek your guidance and support as we move ahead with these efforts. Thanks again for your time. My colleagues and I are happy to take your questions. Well, I want to thank you, Deputy Commissioner, for your testimony today. And we've been joined by my colleague also, Council Member Mark Jainai from the Boogie Down Bronx. Um, and, I, and I thank you for, in your last part of your testimony, that in the past that 
the system, ACS, is, uh, the juvenile system has always had a good relationship with the city council. Um, and we look forward to continuing that. Um, and I say that with all sincerity, that I'm hoping that our conversations will always be spirited. They will always be real. And if we can't get it right, then we try to correct it to get it right. Um, one of the things um, I will add, and then I'll let my colleague share whatever he wants to sh share and have a question or so, is that while your testimony gives us a breakdown and an outline of the great things that the system is looking to do and has done and has a, and, and wants to build on, sometimes we don't get into the meat and potatoes of what are the struggles and all the challenges that you're facing each and every day. And I think that's what these hearings are allowing us to open up and rece review so we can figure out solutions to help you manage and, and, and deliver for our children in New York. So that's going to be pretty much um, my first question to kick off mm -hmm. to you um, is that right now with all the gr things that you've accomplished, I'd like to know what are some of the greatest strengths that you think you have in your system right now? And then from there, what are some of the weaknesses that we can need to improve on? Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, I, I mean, as you heard before, we, we in New York City actually are lucky to have a continuum of services that actually responds to the needs of our communities and the youth that we serve. Um, we may take it for granted, but that's not the case across the nation. Many, many, many other systems, and actually this system not that long ago, up to before 2012, was a disjointed system where actually the locality had really little say in the outcomes of the young people from our neighborhood and community. Close to home is one of the few efforts nationally that actually has a showcase that actually localities or cities or counties can actually do juvenile justice system better mm -hmm. when it's actually on the hands of those who know the community and the youth best, instead of being run by distant si state systems. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in that context, one of our biggest challenges is the realization that actually even though the state acknowledges that close to home is working, uh, as though we know from a most re a recent report that I'm sharing with you guys from the NE Casey Foundation is the way that many other jurisdictions are trying to implement their juvenile justice system continuum. Uh, it's, it's a challenge that we are not getting funded again. The fact that actually New York City did what no other county did in New York State when he was willing to step up and say these are our young people, we want to take care of them on our own. We want to step up the resources of our Department of, the, of uh, the Education. We want to step up the resources of the Administration for Children's Services. We want to step up the resources of the Department of Probation. And we all come in together to actually take ownership of the young people in our neighborhoods. It's, it's um, incredible to actually believe that now we're actually not, we're not having the funding to support such a program. So that's actually one of our biggest challenges right now. Okay. On top of that, we are actually being mandated to enact the Raise the Age legislation, which is something that the city and many of you have been advocating for years, and we are not given any support to do that kind of work in New York City. Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to get into both of those conversations when it comes to close at home and, and Raise the Age. I don't want to jump in it too early mm -hmm. because that's going to be a conversation that's going to engulf the room mm -hmm. and more than 30 minutes of conversation that we have right now. Uh, but I think we, we talked about dedicating one of our meetings specifically for that. We'll touch base on it, okay. but just dedicating a, a hearing strictly on what that should look like and what ACS is going to need. Um, I just want to go back to some of the questions that, you know, I tried to formulate before you got in the room. It's about, you know, I heard you have funding challenges when it comes to close to home and, and making sure that we work with you and work with the governor to advocate to get that funding. Um, other than the close to home and trying to figure out the close to home, what are the things that ACS are doing to set a positive stage for our young people as yeah. soon as they come into your doors or they come through the system? Yeah. Um, one of the things that actually we are very proud of, and I alluded in the testimony, is that actually our juvenile justice system is not premised on custody. I mean, as you heard before, the number of young people in detention continue to decrease and actually has continued to decrease significantly for the last 10 years. The number of young people in placement continues to decrease. It wasn't that long ago when, maybe five or six years ago, there were 1,000 young people or more from New York City in the custody of OCFS. How many kids we have in close to home today, John? 231. 
we only have 231 of those young people. That's a testimony to the efforts by the Department of Probation, ACS, and others to support young people before they have to get into custody. And one of the things that actually we're struggling with is the background that actually, again, the state is imposing a cap in our ability to get reimbursement for preventive services. One of the things that we do really, really well is the ability to allow a family, a parent, a teacher, a police officer to refer a young person to our family assess assi assessment program, which actually is available to deploy services before the young person has to enter the juvenile justice system. We serve almost 6,000 families a year, and we believe that we should be expanding our services in that continuum so that young people don't even have to get to close to home or detention. Good, good. Uh, ounce of prevention is always better than a pound of cure. And I think that's the, the way we should always continue to operate when it comes to helping our children out. Um, I want to jump into something in regards to, you know, the conditions, the mental health conditions of some of the um, our young people mm -hmm. who are in need of um, re-educating themselves so they can be productive adults. Now, you know, how does the Department of Health connect with you all when they come in for our services? I know s on site, some there are some doctors on site or there's how do you deal with that, that young person that come in has really strong mental health issues? Okay. I mean, uh, our continuum actually has one of the best comprehensive mental health systems in the nation. Um, we are lucky um, to have a very deep and productive partnership with Bellevue Hospital under the Health and Hospital Corporations, um, under Health and Hospitals. Um, and Stephanie Prusa can talk a little bit more about the specifics in detention, but Every young person who comes through our door in detention uh, gets screened and assessed for health and mental health needs. And based on their needs, we could continue to do deeper evaluations through psychological and psychiatric assessments. We also have uh, uh, MSW level clinicians with a separate organization called START who are available seven days a week. Um, we also have um, and at night we have an on-call service. Mm -hmm. um, our clinicians provide um, therapeutic services uh, to individually and they also conduct groups um, several times a week on our living areas and they also uh, have their offices on our uh, youth living areas in detention. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I don't want to neglect is that uh, one something that we have learned in the work with Bellevue and others um, which actually I think we're becoming an actual uh, um, example for others, is that the first line of defense or the first line of intervention for many of the young people that we work with are not just the clinicians, it's actually the frontline staff. So for the last five years, we have in intentionally invested a significant amount of resources and training, particularly on detention, to help our juvenile counselors acquire uh, skills to run actually evidence-based, trauma-informed groups. And what we have learned is actually many of these young, um, many of the young people that we serve tend to gravitate to our juvenile counselors as the first person, sometimes in their life, that they can connect to and they can learn how to regulate their emotions and behaviors. We need clinicians to support them, but uh, I don't want to minimize the importance of actually caring adults in the life of these kids 24-7. Mm, and, and that does make so much sense because you definitely need quality people in there that's going to the kids children connect with. Yeah. So when we talk about some of our young people who may be struggling mentally, um, does the staff or the, how do they, do they find themselves overwhelmed because if, if your ratio of adult staff to the young people in there can be overwhelming, how do you manage that ratio if you have an overwhelming population of people in one environment mm -hmm. who are having mental issue challenges? Um, I agree. I mean, the young people that we serve, I mean, as I mentioned before, we have less young people in detention than ever before um, by design, which uh, is a good thing. The young people who come to us tend to be those who actually have the highest needs. And, and you're right. You're correct. I mean, they need more attention than ever before. And it's one of those things that we're actually carefully looking on the race, the age. And one of the state mandates is to reduce our caseloads. They're currently actually eight to one, and they have to be reduced at least to six to one. Okay, so while you're reducing caseloads, do you find that there is a, uh, and you said the numbers have gone down, 
but do you find that this quote unquote some form of recidivism that might kick in with some of these young people when they leave out? Do, do you find that you're getting, you know, on, in your numbers that some mm -hmm. of these same individuals with mental health issues are returning back to you, or you have been able to uh, put them on the right path that they don't return back into the system? Yeah. Um, so there's two parts of your question. I think one of them has to do with how well are we meeting the needs of young people while they're under our custody. And I think, you know, additional staff and the support to the staff that we have been able to build recently with Bellevue and others is actually paying off. It's allowing our frontline staff, it's allowing the young people, it's allowing their families to learn new uh, coping mechanisms to be able to regulate their emotions and behavior. And, and that's showing up in actually better behavior in the young people that we serve. Uh, having said that, we struggle continually to make sure that when young people leave our fantastic care in detention and in close to home, that those resources are available in the community. Okay. Um, I just want to put on the record, we've been joined by a colleague from uh, the big island of Brooklyn, um, Council Member Inez Barron. So thank her for being a, a strong advocate in education and in higher education. And since we've just mentioned the word education, I'd like to talk a little bit about education right now, that when young people come into the system, what plans do you have or that are incorporated right now? Because I heard you mention in your testimony that when students were upstate that they were not getting credits when they came back downstate. First question is this, is that still happening because there's still, st still got young people who are not totally transitioned from upstate and what is the educational plans that you have um, currently right now to ensure that children stay on track and then when they are released that they're able to move forward and follow the paths of higher, ed higher education? I mean, first, um, no court adjudications are in upstate New York right, anymore. Good to hear that. Um, all New York City kids who go through the family court are staying in New York City. Um, and in terms of how we manage uh, their educational transition through our placement to aftercare, I think John is the best person to talk about that. Thank you. Um, we, we have a really close partnership with the Department of Education. Um, Department of Education teachers are the folks who teach our kids, but going all the way back when a kid first is placed by the family court in close to home, by the time that child leaves detention, more often than not, we have all of their educational records at our disposal. I think that's one of the true benefits of close to home. That continuity that exists begins right at the time of intake, um, and the Department of Education has education transition specialists who are embedded within our schools in close to home, and they're responsible for um, overseeing the plan for that child to return to the community so that every moment in, in the child's schooling while they're in close to home then translates to when they leave. There's a, there's a lot of oversight on DOE's part. Um, we have case managers who partner with DOE to ensure that the right school is um, chosen for when kids do return home because some of our kids obviously um, need to go to either a different school or we really at least need to closely evaluate their home school to make sure that it provides them with the greatest opportunity for success and um, we've been very successful at doing that. Um, how long before a, and I call them students because mm -hmm. even though they're in the system, they're still learning and that's what a student is, someone who's ever learning. So when they go into the system, when is it they, the time frame that they actually start that educational piece of academics? So if a, if a young person is actually arrested in New York City and, um, you know, a juvenile delinquent is actually brought into the doors of our facility uh, horizons within two days, the most, they actually are in a classroom run by the Department of Education. Uh, that person, uh, that student is actually immediately getting educated while they're waiting for their trial to be uh, completed. And if that young person, as John mentioned before, by any chance is adjudicated, we immediately start working with the Department of Education. It's exactly the same district that runs the school in detention, runs the schools in close to home. So we actually can have a meaningful transition that involves the parent, the, the provider agency, our um, ACS staff, our pregnancy planning specialist, an educational transitional guidance counselor at detention, and someone from the receiving school within District 79. And all of these folks actually meet together at what we call a transitional meeting where we talk about you are moving out of detention to the next phase in placement. And that happens immediately. There's actually no gap or moment where kids are not getting an education. And that's, that's, that's a big change. I mean, mm -hmm. um, um, 
not to age myself, but it wasn't that long ago when you will talk to kids and they will say, well, I'm coming back from OCFS facilities and I'm watching Ricky Lake uh, for m weeks before I get into the right school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, I, if I could just add a couple, t two, um, two pieces of data that I think support the, the good work we're doing with Department of Education. Um, 93% of our middle students increase at least one grade level while they're in close to home, in placement in close to home. So we're talking about that's a roughly a six, seven month stay. So that's really rather substantial. And these typically are kids who are substantially behind when they came into close to home. So the fact that they're improving by at least a grade level is rather amazing. And the other piece it to it is, is um, uh, in the school year 2016 from the previous year, we increased the number of credits that were earned while kids were in placement by 31%. Up to while kids are in placement, they're earning 9.3 credits. Thank you for that answer. I do want to, before I turn it over to my colleagues who may have a question or two, uh, placement, when students are getting their education in, inside a facility or in a detention center, and then they're transitioned out, how do you work with the Department of Education and I'm not talking about trans, I'm trans out of the system altogether, they're tr placed back. How do you work with them, their family, to remove the stigma that I have failed or something was wrong with me, um, I messed up, I'm a bad person, because that's part of the self-esteem of how I get myself back together and assimilate back into society. How do you work with these students um, and helping them on the right path? I mean, I think, I think you're talking about one of the biggest challenges in the juvenile justice system. I mean. If you were to look at the data of the young people that we serve, I mean, you look at their attendance record before getting into the juvenile justice system, and it's really, really low. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's kind of sad that they have to kind of get through us to immediately get perfect attendance for a while. And then actually our data shows that actually once they're with us, they actually their attendance is better than it used to be. Um, having said that, we struggle consistently on how we get schools in the community to engage our young people. And I John can talk about the dynamics of how we do that through a family conference and other things as well. As Deputy Commissioner Franco was saying, that, that certainly, as you asked about challenges, um, continued good attendance in school, I would say, is, is certainly a, a challenge. To address that, uh, we w we're working with DOE and their education transition specialists longer after kids leave placement. Um, but in addition to that, if we have kids who um, come out, they're attending school well, um, but then their, their attendance declines. We use a model called family team conferencing where we pull together everyone who's involved in that youth's life, including the youth, their caregiver, um, the educational staff, any provider staff who are involved, our staff, and we have a team conference which then really looks at what's behind this story, why isn't this child attending school as, as frequently as we'd like to have them attend. Um, and then we make, th we, based on that discussion, we take what we consider the next best step in terms of addressing that behavior. Sometimes it's a kid who's afraid to go to school because they have relationships with other peers there where they're not feeling safe. Other times, uh, there might be other draws that keep them from attending school. So we want to understand what those are so then we can come up with the right plan for the right kid. Okay, well, I thank, I thank you for those answers. And you mentioned your relationship, which we are going to look to probably have one of our hearings with the Department of Education and Juvenile Justice, just to make sure that we are in sync, um, because I do understand the deal. We have their own protocols, their own, own rules, and while on paper we are committed when it's time to tell a human to implement some activity that's going to help a child, some bureaucracy gets in the way, or scheduling gets in the way, or I'm just not feeling it today, and and at the end of the day, our student <coughs> suffers from that. So we want to make sure that everyone is committed to helping a young person. This is up to that commitment. So uh, I want to thank you. And I'm going to, before I turn it over to uh, the council members, the, uh, you mentioned something about reducing caseloads. What would you say is a reasonable caseload that a staffer can manage? And, you know, to clarify, I, th I think I used the, right, the wrong term when I mentioned caseloads. Uh, I was mentioning the youth to staff ratio in detention, okay. uh, which is actually by regulations for secure detention is eight to one, with the new race the age regulation is six to one, and that actually that's what we strive for every youth and every facility, and I think that would be the minimum of the young pe people that we serve. Um, as you mentioned so well before, 
We have less kids, but we have more, many, many, many needs, and we have to be attentive to that. Okay, thank you. Um, I do not want to be the only voice in the room. That's why it's a committee. So I'm going to, since the council member Joe and I um, came in, like give him an opportunity. Say again. Okay. Uh, well, Councilman Barron, who's a staunch advocate of education in our children, um, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. New committee for you. Uh, and also welcome to the new com committee member. And to the panel, thank you for coming. Uh, we've had some interaction before because I've been on this committee. So in, in the family assessment program, so you have this chart which talks about the structure. You have community, you have detention, and placement. In the family assessment program, which is listed in the community part where students are, where children and mm -hmm. are not held and where they're not uh, in detention, who are the personnel that are involved in the administering of that program? Who are the people who go into the home? What do they do? What are the titles? What are the positions? What are their responsibilities? I think uh, uh, Social Commissioner Hamilton can answer this better. Okay. I think it's important for us to, um, uh, you know, represent that is is one of our, uh, you know, best preventive programs and right. have, it has a long history of being effective at reducing the number of kids who come to the juvenile justice system. And the front end, I mean, is staffed right. by our uh, staff. Is, is, you know, we have a significant amount of staff in within the FAP officers that actually are the gatekeepers and engagers of families when they come through the front door. Right, so the, um, as Deputy Commissioner Franco mentioned, the FAP staff, our ACS staff, um, the families walk through our front door. Um, either they hear about it and they walk in or they're referred by the schools or the NYPD. Um, and so we, that's the bulk of our referrals are from the NYPD and the schools. Um, that's how the families hear about the family assessment program. The FAP staff um, are the first people who see the youth and the parent, um, and they are MSWs, licensed MSWs, and they conduct an assessment of the youth and the family, and they determine what level of service, along with the youth and family, that, that would serve the needs of, of that family. Um, and then they're referred out to sometimes our contracted providers or to a community-based provider. Um, the contracted services that we have are um, mostly evidence-based programs, therapeutic in nature, um, where the therapist from the agency is going out to the home, um, working with the family and the youth in the community, um, and trying to resolve whatever the issues are that are presented. Okay. Um, and do you have any data as to the number of children who are in foster care who are participants in any of the levels of your programs? So, so our not just the FAP, but all three mm -hmm. levels. Yeah. So we, are, we, you mean the cross? As, are you talking about the crossover youth, the young people who are involved in foster care and cross over to the juvenile justice system? Well, that as well as children who remain in foster care but have some contact mm -hmm. with your system. Right. So our our we have a unit in um, my in the community based alternative division um, that is called the confirm unit that tracks or identifies the young mm -hmm. people who are crossing over from from child welfare to juvenile justice um, and we do have some data on the number of youth who have been identified um, either in foster care or another child welfare preventive or some other child welfare um, involvement who have gotten arrested um, which i can share with you if that's what you're asking for well in part so what determines if a child is a crossover child? A young person who is involved either in our foster care system, right. receiving preventive services, or um, under the supervision of our Division of Child Protection and get arrested. Okay, does that child have the opportunity to go back to the foster home or not? Yes. Oh, okay, is. Yes. all right. Because when you said crossover, I thought it meant, okay, no. that's it. Yeah, no, no, no. And actually, that's one of the things with the, with the work that we're doing on crossover youth is trying to get the two systems to talk to each other right. uh, because before um, we started this work, the, mm -hmm. the systems are very siloed right. um, and they don't know what, e what each one is doing with the other, uh, with the child and the family. And so what the crossover youth practice model that we have implemented along with many stakeholders um, across the city is to get the child welfare side and the juvenile justice side to come together and create a plan for that young person so that they do not 
further enter the juvenile ju do not enter or further enter the juvenile justice system. So how do you measure the success of your program, the community program? How do you measure the success that you achieve? Mm -hmm. What are your benchmarks? Yeah. What are your indicators that you can point to? Right. I um, imagine it's kind of difficult to say, but what are your benchmarks? What I mean, are your one, indicators of success? Yeah, I mean, one, one area that actually, um, you know, it's easy for us to see based on the numbers is the fact that actually we have less kids in the system than ever before. And the reality is that in, particularly for those kids that actually have been arrested, that actually are in the process of being adjudicated, not that long ago, most of the kids were placed in a bed. They actually were removed from their homes and they will be sent away to a facility uh, like OCFS. Uh, the fact that actually the city, you know, the Department of Probation and others began what we call alternative to placement programs mm -hmm. like the AJI, uh, has actually resulted in hundreds of kids in any one year that actually are being supervised by the Department of Probation, receiving services such as the ones that we provide with the AJI or like mentorship programs that actually have been shown significant success, particularly recently, uh, that actually are allowing young people to safely be kept in the community with the right supports and the right accountability. And that's the story behind why the numbers are so low. So do you have a specific dedicated mentorship program or is it a part of the services that goes on? Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's something that some folks here know better than I do. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, when the city decided that we wanted to ensure that only those kids that needed to be removed from their homes had to go to close to home, mm -hmm. the city created an array of alternative to placement programs. They include, the, bi the biggest one is JJI, which is run by ACS which are programs that are focused on the family as a unit of intervention where we go to the home and Sarah describes some of those programs. The Department of Probation very wisely also developed a set of programs that are more focused on peer networks and leisure time and created a significant amount of really exciting new alternative to placement that are based on credible messengers and mentorship. And it's one of those things that we're very proud of doing very well in New York City and so in fun. which programs, or how many children who are in the programs have mentors? I heard, I'm glad for the peer-to-peer, -peer, but there's another interaction yeah. that comes with a mentor who's someone you perhaps a little older, a little mm -hmm. more experienced, I mean, someone who may have gone through that same type of social conditions and has another type of insight to share. So how many children actually get a mentor yeah, for whatever I, period of I, time? Again, I, um, I know about how successful the program is. It's run by our partners of the Department of Probation, and I okay. would be more than willing to work with them to get you the answers that you need. Okay. But it's one of the great stories of New York City. It's working really well. I was very pleased to hear about the students who are, are come into the facility and are able to gain significant credits and to increase their reading competency. I think that's so important. And the question that I have is how long, what's the average length of stay that a student has in uh, your facility? The two, what's the average, in, in a detention, what's the average in placement? Yeah, I mean, detention, I, I would imagine, is much shorter. Yes, and you know, I, I, th I think it's usually better to think uh, about the youth in detention in three cohorts. At least that's right the way I used to think about it. We, we have a significant number of young people who come to us for a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, they, they may spend one to four days with okay. us. They they go through the court process. Okay. Again, our partner agency in probation may do an adjustment, and they go home safely okay. under supervision. There's a group of kids that actually are through the family court, and some, um, you know, uh, so about 20-something percent of them, I could get you the exact number, get placed in close to home. That length of stay tends to be about 27 to 29 days. And again, those are the young people that John talked about where we have a meeting and we create a meaningful transition to placement. And then we have juvenile offenders that actually account now for the majority of kids in detention. As it, so these are young people who have committed some serious crimes and actually their case is being heard in the criminal court. And their length of stay tends to be 90 days or more. Okay, and the students who might come to you who have IEPs, which I would imagine might be quite a, quite a large number. Are there specifically special ed teachers that assist these children with their learning activities, or are they sensitized, dedicated teachers who are doing the best they can? 
Again, our partners at the Department of Education um, reassess every youth when they come to, to detention and placement. And I think they would be better than I would I explain the resources that they have available okay. to them. Okay. And what are the actual staff title positions in the placement facility or the detention? What are the titles of the people who are working in that in that location? We begin with detention. So in detention, we have juvenile counselors, uh, juvenile counselor series. There are frontline staff that work directly with the children. We also have associate juvenile counselors and uh, uh, what we call tour commanders, which is a, a mid-level supervisory position. We have operations managers, we have case managers, um, and we have a whole range of supportive staff. We have clinicians, but um, they're contracted. Do you have yeah. any medical staff? Yes, we have Floating Hospital, um, is a nonprofit organization that supplies all of our medical care. We and have, they're on site? They're on site 24-7. Um, we have medical doctors and uh, the and physicians' assistants. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're quite welcome, Councilman Byrne, and you're always welcome to chime in again, as well as yeah. Councilman Joe and I, um, at any given time. But I do want to just fo follow up on something that Councilman Byrne, you guys were, were discussing. You were just talking about health services and on-call doctors and 24-hour services. So when a student does is this discharge after all is said and done with who is the one who monitors their health records and do they have access of their health records when they leave how does that how does the system operate with when a child is leaving the system um if 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 the youth has an ongoing medical I issue our our medical doctors contact um their doctors in in the community for a continuity of care I think one of the things that actually, um, again, is unique and, and, and something that other folks are looking at is because we provide the care for, you know, detention and placement in New York City, we actually have the ability to do what um, Associate Commissioner Prusak talked about. Uh, our doctors have actually, mm, in many occasions, actually made appointments for young people in their own primary doctor to ensure continuity when necessary. Okay, thank you. I'm going to back up on the health question again because I'd like to know in your in the population if you have a young person who is sick or has a transmittable disease, um, how do you manage that in, in your population? Um, most of our youth don't have that, but um, um, if we cannot treat a youth within our own, um, we, we would bring them to a hospital or an emergency room. Um, but um, we do have isolation rooms, but we, you know, other than with the flu or, you know, um, we don't have that much of an issue with, you know, com things that are long-term communal. But, but you know, I was, I was in Horizons, you know, two weeks ago, and there was a young person with the flu. You know, our medical clinic actually has dedicated beds so that kids can get care in the facility. Mm. Okay, because I know that can be a real issue. Mm -hmm. One gets sick, other one gets sick, mm -hmm. yes, or if someone has we, a disease. We have experienced that with mm -hmm. chicken pox and flu in the past. We've been, I should knock on wood somewhere, we've been very <laughs> fortunate this year so <laughs> far. We haven't had uh, any major outbreaks. Okay, I want to just jump over into a couple other questions. And I'll follow one something you said about your, your crossover youth. How many of them, do you have a number of crossover youth of how many people were, our young people were in the system who were receiving services and they broke the law and then all of a sudden they had to be crossed over? And when you've identified that number, um, whatever happens to that person, uh, that those numbers, do, do they end up staying in that s new system for them or do they transition back, you know, after yeah. assessments done? How, how does that play out? Yeah, before we get into the specifics, I, th I think we open up talking about, you know, a known fact now that young people who actually go through abuse and neglect sadly are very likely to finish up in the juvenile justice system. Uh, so it's actually a testament to, to the commitment to our youth in child welfare at ACS that we made an investment in the cross over youth practice. I mean, uh, Commissioner Hansen and all of us truly believe that we want the best welfare of every youth that actually is in the child welfare system. And we truly believe that actually the juvenile justice system is not a good outcome for any of them. So um, we, we work really hard to make sure that um, 
the young people who struggle, and many of the young people that we know in foster care face struggle with behavioral challenges that they're not penalized again or victimized again. And that's what the crossover youth system does. Mm -hmm. So in terms of numbers, um, as I mentioned, the CONFIRM unit um, sends out notifications of young people who are in foster care, who are receiving preventive services, or who are under the supervision of Division of Child Protection. We send out notifications to certain parties when that happens. Um, and in 2016, um, there were 744 notifications sent about crossover youth. Um, and of those, several youth had been arrested more than once, so multiple notifications went out. So of the 744 notifications, there were 430 individual youth. So 430 individual youth arrested 744 times. And I can give you the breakdown of the child welfare category if, if, if you want that. Um, but the, there were 144 youth who were receiving supervision by Division of Child Protection, 211 youth in foster care, 337 youth who were involved in our preventive services, and 52 youth who were being served by the family assessment program. I'd like to get that report after sure, and, and absolutely. just get how those numbers are playing. Because yeah. I'd like to know those, the kids that, that are 400 plus, have they made their ways back over to the other side and are they stable again? Right. Or is there, or is, there were a point in time that the system says, okay, this is your third arrest. No, you're not coming back over. We're moving you into something more secure. I right. So once a young per if a young person is in our child welfare system, they don't leave. So even if they go to detention or close to home, the foster care agency, if the youth is in foster care, still has to, to maintain contact with that young person and plan for that young person if they were to leave detention or close to home. So they cannot and that is part of this model is, is saying you can't just drop this child because they've been arrested and are in one of our other facilities. I guess the question I'm trying to ask, even if I've been in the system for a year and I haven't done anything, but I'm not going through my counseling and I'm getting much, but I get arrested mm -hmm. and then I come back and then I get arrested again. Then I come back and I get arrested again. Is there ever a point the sisters does it say, no, you just can't come back to the group home, but we're going to put you in one of our secure facilities because your court case is pending and you no longer come back to this group home. Right. I'm just trying to find, is that yeah. how we're operating? Or? So the foster care agency cannot say that. That okay, would just be great. a determination up to the family court judge whether to place them in detention at that point or All right. not. All right, that, that, that's good to hear, good to know. Um, talking about kids who are in the system, I wanted to know as you educate them, how do, because not every child is struggling with because they are just bad people and they're, and they're broken souls. Not every child's a broken soul and there is some discipline and they're just, young people make mistakes mm -hmm. and it puts them in certain places. So for that child that has, um, how do you maintain whatever culture that they are growing up or an environment or any religious beliefs or anything that, you know, that's, that, ha that was a part of their makeup? How do you, how is the system able to have some continuity for that child. Yeah, so I mean, we we par pay particular attention to um, access to the faith-based community throughout the continuum. Um, Stephanie can talk about what, is, um, Rufa can talk about what we do in detention, and then we can talk about close to home. Um, so as Commissioner Franco said, we do have a lot of faith-based folks that come in. Uh, we try to have a lot of family engagement activities with, with our families. We. We have visiting four times a week and we have uh, family days uh, once a month where we put on performances and we, we invite everybody in, um, siblings, cousins, uh, uh, all sorts of family members um, to engage with the kids and see the work that they've been doing, look at their artwork. Um, we, uh, we celebrate uh, Every month we have different cultural events that we celebrate. We just went through Black History Month uh, this month. Uh, next month is Women's History Month. Um, we uh, we engage a whole group of providers um, to provide um, activities for the youth um, to increase their skills to um, through, we, we have a DYCD that comes in and um, that provides Sonic, which is an after-school program, and we have all sorts of 
uh, providers coming in, providing music and dance and all sorts of cultural activities for the youth. I mean, the, the advantage of close to home uh, compared to what it used to be is that um, young people are close to their families and their communities. Um, if I can just go back, um, I, I, would, I would agree with you. I, I would say, though, 100% of our kids have made mistakes. They're not hardened criminals. They're not, uh, they're not um, destined to a life in adult mm -hmm. corrections. Um, and, and as a result of that, we want to look at what are those needs that do correlate with predicting future criminal behavior for each kid and make sure we address those individualized needs. And for our kids, you know, that it's family circumstances and parenting, it's education, it's uh, how they use their leisure, it's who are they hanging out with, who are their peers, and what are they doing when they're with their peers. Um, and it's about substance abuse. So for Close to Home, we want to make sure we address those needs. We, we, we assess and we address those needs very specifically. And then there's the other side of that child where we want to make sure that they're connected to those positive youth development activities that are built on their strengths, built on their interests. And as the result of an individualized plan, we then want to, we want to identify all those things and make sure that while the kid is in placement with us and as we think about them transitioning back to the community on aftercare, that we are connecting kids to services in their communities that they're going to not just attend while they're on aftercare and under our supervision, but hopefully long after that, so that they're able to develop and sustain long-term relationship with the faith-based community, with other cultural um, centers and activities that exist for them. So they, they have an opportunity while in placement um, to experience those and then hopefully stay involved once they are. Thank you for that answer. And I have two more questions, and I'm, um, I just want to put on a record that we've been joined by another one of my colleagues from the Boogie Down Bronx, Councilman Richie Torres. Thank you for joining us today. Um, when we start talking about this whole discharge and family planning and involvement, what would, can you give us an idea of the percentages of families who stay engaged with their children as they re-educate, not just the child being re-educated, but the family being re-educated at the same time they're dealing with the scenarios they're living in? So th this is a good story, and then it'll speak to one of the other challenges in terms of mm -hmm. close to home. Um, most of our kids, the vast majority of our kids, return home to their families. I can give you the specific number. We can send that as a follow-up. Um, but the vast majority, while they're in placement, stay connected to their families. We have services while they're in placement that address family issues through counseling. We rely on aftercare services, as you heard from Associate Commissioner Hemeter, that, that go out into the home and work with the families to make sure communication is effective and it's addressing the needs of that family. So we're very proud of that. Um, unlike any other system I've seen, families are engaged. And when families are reluctant, we're, we're partnering with our community agencies where the kids are living, and we're making sure that we're doing everything we can to keep them engaged. Um, that said, as our population's gotten smaller, um, the needs of that population have gone up as a whole. And um, unfortunately, then the number of kids who are placed in other than family residences have gone up in close to home over the past few years. Um, sometimes they come in as crossover youth, so they're already involved with the foster care system, but we still then want to reach out and try to do everything we can to reconnect those kids to their parents and or extended families. But then we also see because these kids have presented such challenges to their families over a long period of time. We see families that are then able to, while that child is out of their home, parent and attend to the needs of their other children, um, reset in a way. And so what we've seen is a number, an increase in the number of families that then stop participating over time. And so that's something that we're working hard to address. Um, and one final question as we start wrapping up and pass up to my colleagues. I'd like to get an idea of the ethnic breakdown of the young people that are in the system. Because I got some disturbing news and I just want to hear from you all, what is the ethnic breakdown of our young people in the system? You know, I, I know that actually we talked about that when you came to Ryer and you immediately pointed out that every, every one of the young women that you met were either African American or uh, Latino. So I want to get you the right numbers. Um, uh, so uh, African American youth com 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 comprise 64% of the youth in detention and 61% of the youth in close to home. 
Hispanic youth com comprise 30% of the youth in detention and 36%, I mean, and 30% and of the kids, kids in close to home. So to your, to your question, the reality is that our system serves mainly African-American Latino kids. Right. And, uh, and, I, and I have a problem with that because 13-year-olds are 13-year-olds, no matter the difference if you're black, Puerto Rican, white, yellow, green, whatever they want to call it. You know, 13-year-olds do the same dumb things on any given day. So I'm trying to understand how come that if young black males make up 5% of New York City's population, how come they make up over half of the population that's in a system that can lead them into incarceration? Can you do you have an answer for that? Is that an NYPD issue? Wh where where are we with this? I mean, I I can answer with what we're doing at ACS, and 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 I think we open up talking about the significant reduction of number of young people in the human justice system. Again, the fact that actually so fewer of them are in the system is a good thing that we should celebrate. Um, I think it's actually about if young people. Um, that come from just certain neighborhoods and actually are from certain ethnic backgrounds are gonna be in a juvenile justice system, what kind of juvenile justice system should that be? And, and this I can speak with some authority because having run the state system, the fact that actually mainly 1,000 um, young people from New York City not that long ago were actually placed in facilities far away from home where actually they were being managed and supervised by folks who have actually maybe never been in New York City is actually not what we want. The fact that actually young people now are in close to home sites where actually their guidance and counseling and supervision is coming from folks that actually come from the same communities that actually can talk with some credibility about this is how I made it, this is actually how I was able to focus on school, this is how I was able to graduate, that has a big value in actually not continue to decrease the number of young people that are coming to the system. I mean, we, we have a system now where actually, if you go to any of the facilities which you, you've been to, and I hope every one of you come to, the folks who are actually guiding our young people are folks that actually made it out of the same neighbors and the same communities. They made it like you and I did, and they can talk with that credibility about, you can make it, and I, I'm a proof that you can actually make it. And that's not the case across the nation. Most young people in juvenile justice systems in elsewhere are actually placed far away from home and managed and supervised by people who have no relationship or connection to the neighborhoods. Right. Well, I thank you for that answer. I'm gonna come back mm -hmm. to this conversation, but I want to turn the mic over to Boogie Down Bronx, mm -hmm. Council Member Richie Torres. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I ask questions that have been posed, I apologize, but it's been said that in politics, everything that has been said might have been said, but not everyone has said it, so I will. <laughs> um, obviously, there's a state law that requires the transfer of 16 and 17 year olds from Rikers Island by October of 2018. Right? There's a recognition that Rikers is a criminogenic environment, there's a culture of violence, the dock officers at Rikers are ill-equipped to supervise 16 and 17 year olds. That, that would seem to be the recognition and the logic behind that law. I have concerns about the plans to uh, have dock officers to supervise 16, 17 year olds in the new detention centers. That would seem to undermine the purpose and logic of the state's law. So can you reconcile that for me? You know, I, I worry that we run the risk of, of effectively exporting the culture of violence uh, that this law was intended to end. I mean, the, the law, as created by um, the state requires a partnership between the sheriff's department and the juvenile justice system across the state of New York. In our case, you know, the sheriff's department and the department of corrections. So the law is actually was enacted with an intentionality to have a partnership between DOC and ACS, uh, in our case in New York City. Having said that, I, I agree with you. And well I the law does not require the transfer of DOC officers to these ACS doesn't, facilities. Doesn't. So why couldn't we have ACS officials who are especially trained to interact with 16 and 17 year olds? Yeah. I mean, the city is actually in, in the gist of figuring out the transfer. There's two things to the race, the age law. One is actually the servicing of the race, the age youth, the first group of youth, first group of youth coming to us in October 2001, uh, um, 2018, and then the second group coming in 2019. 
there's also a unique mandate for New York City that doesn't happen across the state of also moving the kids out of the jail to out of, in our case, Rikers. We're actually doing everything that we can to figure out how to do that, and the intent of the city is to sustain the spirit of the juvenile justice system. The regulations are very clear. I mean, they, they require most of the practices, most of the staff, most of the training to abide by juvenile ju justice standards. And yeah, but standards on paper are one thing, right? Culture is something else, mm -hmm. right? Like in theory, there should be no culture of violence. There's no law that mm -hmm. legitimizes the culture of violence at Rikers Island, but there's a disconnect between what the law requires and what is actually unfolding in real life. And I worry mm -hmm. that we're replicating that dynamic at these detention centers. My understanding, when did you find out that these uh, specialized secure detention centers could be co-located with, um, or what, what's the juvenile detention center? So. There's a two different licensing process. So actually a facility is currently licensed as a secure detention facility. We'll have to go through a different process to be licensed as a secure, specialized secure detention facility. Uh, one licensing process, which is the one that we have now, is under the jurisdiction of OCFS. The other one is under the jurisdiction of OCFS and state commission. But, but the law allows you to, for existing juvenile detention centers to function as SSDs, right? Once you make some modifications to them, yes. And so when did you find out that that was going to be the case? When was it the regulations came out? Some moment in December. I th actually, I, I, if I remember oh, correctly. Did the regs come out? Yeah, the regs. Yeah. December. Because I have, apparently there was a memo from OCFS to secure detention administrators dated September 11th, 2017, mm. which is more than a year from October 2018. Mm. So I would think within the span of a year, we could hire and train officials who are professionally equipped to supervise 16 and 17 year olds, right? If we can implement the largest pre K program. Mm -hmm. across multiple agencies within a matter of months. Why can't we hire 100 ACS officials who are specially trained to deal with 16 and 17 year olds? It seems like we're New York City. Mm -hmm. we, we intend to hire as many amazing juvenile justice counselors or some new type as we can. But I guess why are we transferring DOC officers when we can actually get it And you, you mean transferring DOC officers where? We're tr to these SSDs. Yeah, we, you know, we haven't, the city hasn't determined which facility will be the special and secure detention facility. And in that facility, there will have to be a partnership between the Department of Corrections and ACS. And I'm all so for partnership. The, the, but the level of that partnership has But can you guarantee us that there will be no DOC officers supervising 16 and 17 year olds? No, I can't. Okay, and why can't you guarantee that? Our largest challenge right now is actually um, as amazing as our staff is now, we don't have enough of them to manage our operations. And our main focus is actually to staff up. So why can't we hire new staff to meet, meet the need? We what is the barrier? Right now we have significant challenges uh, in terms of attracting and retaining a staff within the current time frame. So if you have so you feel like you're not able to hire, how, how, many, how many officials would you need to hire to supervise the 16 and 17 year olds in these SSDs? Yes, some of our projections mean that we need to have them in place around 120. So you can't staff. find 120 people in a city of 8 million people? Not in the current um, civil service. I just refuse to accept that. Okay. That's unacceptable. Like within the span of a year, we, the, 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 the most, we are the most well-oiled municipal machine in the country and we cannot find and train 120 people to supervise 16 and 17 year olds in SSDs, I, I, that strikes me as implausible. Mm -hmm. And if we can't do it within a year, then at what point can we do it? Mm -hmm. We're working very closely with our partners across the city to figure out a way of bringing on board the right staff that gets um, to do the work that we want in the juvenile justice system. Look, I feel like it's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. We should be able to hire proper officials within a year and even if you're technically complying with the letter of the law, I think we're failing to honor the spirit of, of what this ref reform was intended to achieve. So with that said, th that's the extent of my question. Thank you, Councilmember Torres, and I thank
thank you for leading us into the conversation. You, you didn't say anything that no one asked because we were wait we were actually waiting for this part for you and Councilman Williams to get in so we can jump right into it. So right on time. Um, but yes, uh, you know this whole raise the age is going to cause um, some new activity for a lot of us in a way of thinking. And uh, and one of the things and Richie um, Councilman Torres hits on it. Um, and I wanted to bring that up, you know, and I, I proposed to, you know, how do we create a new staff? Because it is kind of almost unacceptable to bring a correction officer where the child sees that person as someone that helps me engage or manage a certain behavior. And I might not, and that might not be what I need if I'm going into a new facility where I'm supposed to be re-educating myself when I have the disciplinarian, not the educator, that's before me. So as I know, we have union brothers in the room and sisters in the room. You know, maybe we can look at creating a new environment of worker who can help facilitate this raise the age. And that means open it up to the ACS worker, open it up to the correction officer to come in, say we have a new position that we're looking to create and pay it a comparable salary. So this way the correction officer who happens to be a correction officer because they have a social worker degree, they've been a caseworker, but the corrections might have paid better than mm -hmm. doing some other work. So I went to corrections, but in my heart, I'm still looking to help redevelop a person. Then the ACS worker who's already made the commitment, mm -hmm. put something like that, and now you don't have the union problem with someone trying to take a correction officer because they're going over to a city worker job, and then mm -hmm. and you avoid that union issue that you might have, that might mm -hmm. arise when you just create something new and different. So I think that might be your best way to get the best qualified people who committed who want to do that while creating a salary and a new workforce that's going to handle this. Because you got to, we got to come up with something, mm -hmm. you know, that to maintain this new population that we're going to have to accommodate in October. And again, as we, we talked earlier, mm -hmm. how do we make sure we put a system in that's going to be stable, not rushing into something mm -hmm. and not having the pieces of the puzzle together. So thank you um, for Councilman Torres for starting this conversation. And we've been joined by the island of Brooklyn again. Councilmember Jamani Williams is in the house. He's out. Um, oh, oh, City of Brooklyn. All right, City of Brooklyn. <laughs> All right, make it do what it do then. Um, you have a couple words, comments you'd like to share at this moment? I mean, I don't know what questions were asked and weren't asked, so. Go for what um, you know, brother. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was just hearing some of, some of the back and forth. Well, one, I, I, th uh, I think the state could have gone a little further, but I was happy with what they did. I wasn't surprised to learn that something that had Cuomo's name on it had mirrors on it to make it look a little bit better. And so I wasn't shocked to find out that um, there wasn't uh, funding um, to it. So I'm, I'm, I'm very disturbed about that. And, and I think someone said there's going to be, the city's putting $200 million, Is that correct? We estimate that the cost will be at least $200 million. Oh, are we, gonna, are we doing it? Is that what's happening? We have to do it. OK. Um, what would be the cost if it was a, a clean raised age? If it was um, was adopted, where all accused 16 and 17 year olds would be processed through the family court without exception. I I don't know what would be the differential. Cost. I know that it's not all. What's the, what's the current law right now in the in the state? Do, do state what does the current state law say? So anyone who uh, commits an offense um, below the age of 16, mm -hmm. based on the offense, could be either be seen through the family court. Or if it's actually a serious felony, it could be seen through the juvenile offenders part in the criminal court. So there's actually th that distinction in New York State as it is. So in our detention facilities when we, we, that we serve now, we have juvenile delinquents, which we talked about before, and we have juvenile offenders that are yo young people who are waiting through trial in the, juvenile, in the criminal court juvenile part. So this is 16 and 17 year olds? That's I mean, sorry, that's 16 that's and below. That's the, cor that's the current state of affairs. 16 and below. Um, what what if we want to include 16 and 17 year olds? The the law enacted by the state, yeah. Again, maybe to use in your term, is not a clean race to age uh, law. Uh, it's, it's not that it moved every 16 and 17 year old to go through the family court. It actually created a bifurcation between uh, juvenile delinquents that are going to go through the family court who are 16 and 17, and this new category uh, called adolescent offenders that will go through the criminal court based on their cases. My question is, you're saying the cost now is $200 million, correct? Mm -hmm. What would the cost be, do we know, if it was a clean raise? You mean a, a bill so that wouldn't have this new category of adults? Yes, if it was 16 and 17-year-olds going, going through, through family, family court. court. I, I don't know. 
practical difference. But I, I imagine that actually will be significantly costly anyway. I mean, when, when you think about the cost, it's about the services that we're going to provide to youth and families. And those are going to be the same no matter what door you go through. You go through the criminal court or you go through the family court. Well, I just want to know if it, the cost would be significantly more than, than what it has, or is there a... Um, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. Um, and uh, DAs may file motions showing extraordinary circumstances to keep a youth accused of nonviolent felony. What are some of the um, circumstances that would have a required extraordinary to keep nonviolent youth in, in, in the court? So DAs, sorry, go ahead. So there's a subcommittee um, that is working on this, uh, the court processing subcommittee, and no one really knows yet what extraordinary circumstances is going to look like. The, it's a DA, the DAs are going to have to answer that question because they are the ones who are going to be making that application. Yikes. So we, we don't know, and it's, I guess it can be different from borough to borough, which means Queens and particularly Staten Island are going to be in bad shape. That's not good. Um, so uh, I caught the tail end of, of my colleague and just wanted to, so the, are you trying to get ACS workers as opposed to the correction officers that were um, at Rikers to cover the SSDs or what, what's, the, what's the plan? Yes, we are. I mean, we're committed to hire more staff. We're committed to hire more staff now. We were committed to hire more staff yesterday. Uh, we, we are short staff in detention. As low as the numbers are, and uh, we had a significant conver you know, conversation before about the high needs of the young people that we serve, their individualized needs and how they have to be met. And the best way to do that is actually by hiring frontline staff. We have amazing staff in detention now. They, they play a very difficult role of actually providing guidance, supervision, structure, and discipline. At the same time, they try to connect to kids and teach them new ways of doing the work. We have struggled in actually attracting the staff and keeping the staff. Um, so is it you need money to, to hire, or is it bureaucracy that's preventing you? We're working really hard to figure out a way to hire the staff that we need. All right. I think I asked a different question. <laughs> um, <laughs> is, it, is it money that you need, or is bureaucracy preventing you from hiring? We're doing everything they can, they, that we can to figure out a way of attracting and keeping the staff that we need. We're hoping that okay, I Let me break it up. Do you have enough money to hire the new staff that you need? We actually have a request to the o OMB and actually to the state to get the funding necessary to attract the right staff. So, so you currently don't think you have enough money to hire the enough staff? Yeah, I mean, race duration, as I said before, is going to cost a l at least $200 million. I and a significant part of that investment is going to be in frontline staff. That takes so if you get the $200 million, you'll be able to hire the additional ACS staff that you need? If we have the resources to attract the staff, then we will work with our partners in labor and others to figure out a way of attracting the right staff. <sighs> <laughs> okay. You need additional funding to hire the adequate staff. Mm -hmm. we, we're clear on that one? Yeah. You're saying $200 million is the correct amount of money? $200 million is the, the estimate that the New York City has to do the full implementation of Raise the Age. That goes beyond just the staff in detention. It, in Does that include staffing yes. that includes ACS? Yes. Okay. So based on that, if you have $200 million, you should be able to staff up at a quick rate so that it's not just the same folks who were there before, but ACS workers who have a more experience dealing with it, as well as, I think, different connections and social services that might be needed. Correct? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure why it took that long to get to yes, <laughs> but um, I want to make sure that um, hopefully we have that. I'm not expecting to get any additional funding from, from Andrew Cuomo. I hope that our state reps, particularly uh, Senator Mahasey, will, will push really hard to make sure that it, in the state, but like you said, it has to get done. Uh, so I just want to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm glad that we're moving in right directions and how we're dealing with uh, young people, how we're dealing with criminal justice to begin with. I mean, often, I often say people say we got to reform the system. I think it's operating the way it was designed to operate. So we just have to completely change, uproot the system, and put another one in place. Um, that's a difficult thing to do, but hopefully we can get there. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Williams. And um, as we wrap up with this panel, um, I think we got a, 
a gist of a little bit about what you all do in the juvenile justice system from the time a young person enters into your doors that you have secure, non-secure, you have FAP services, treatment, counseling, uh, foster care homes, and you have a staff that's responsible for making sure they deliver on all of this. And the challenges are not just financial, but from limited staffing or just policies. And, and Councilman Williams said it best, and I believe that the system of it today is doing what it's designed to do. We do need to make some corrections and all when it comes to justice, not just juvenile, but the, cr the criminal system altogether needs some shaking up, you know, in order for it to deliver on what it needs to deliver. And when you change the policies, the money tends to follow. The policies that are in place, the money's there for the policies that they want to deliver on, whether it trips us up or whether it serves us up. So at the end of the day, I want to say thank you for educating us on this first conversation that we're having today in regards to what the juvenile justice system looks like in the city of New York. Of course, there's going to be more conversations we're going to have. I'm going to be calling on Julie Burley, who is from the mayor's or from the administrative side, for the follow-ups and all the um, outlines and data that, we're, that we've asked for in this hearing. And I, and I definitely want to look forward to seeing the, the material that you send in regards to the successes that you've had in your system. Mm -hmm. You know, we, if we can understand what the success, successful numbers look like, then we can figure out where we need to improve as well. So I want to thank you all for today's testimony. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you if you can stick around for just a minute because the next person that's coming is okay. a young person that I want you to hear from sure. um, so we all can understand what his conversation is going to look like. Uh, I, just, I just got a question that, that, that was asked me to ask of you. So, um, is that to Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, <laughs> good one. <laughs> but it was asking, is there a plan to have separate facilities? And if not, how long will you manage commingling? Mm. Mm. Regar you're regarding what? I guess separate, is there facilities for the older and the younger? Yeah. Will there be any commingling? Yeah, um, our intent is to um, look at, you know, we have two facilities, both of them are actually certified and as Human, secure juvenile delinquent facilities. We are looking at certifying one of them as a specialized secure detention facility. And we're looking at actually having more than those, those, those two facilities, which I think some of you have heard about, uh, were um, asked to the state to make Ella McQueen available as another specialized secure detention facility to be able to meet the demands of race or age. Okay, and go ahead. So the question is, will there be commingling? Because I asked that question when you came uh -huh. before. before yeah. So what is the answer? They, they may be commingling when we feel that it's actually developmentally appropriate and safely to do so. I don't uh, think that's the answer you gave me before, but I'm glad that we're hearing that now because I think that that's very important. You know, we hear loud and clear from everyone. I think we did answer that way. Um, I think I heard particularly from you, I mean, yeah. the importance to have developmentally appropriate placement within housing units. And we believe that. We do that now. I mean, we have, we have housing units where we have young people mm -hmm. who are actually in middle school. We have housing units where young people who are in high school now with detention facilities. We know that's important. Okay. We do the same for close to home. Um, I want to thank you again. And I think what's going to, you're going to, I think what's going to need to happen, we're going to have to have this conversation on the raised days, the hearing. And when you return, being able, you all being able to roll out, express your plan, mm -hmm. so we can get a real idea of how you're handling what's been imposed on us by the state. Mm -hmm. And if there's any real deficits on delivering, then we need to know that n at that hearing, so we can figure out how to plug those holes up. Yeah, one, one thing that I want to implore though, from the council and, and others here is that um, raise the age is not just about the beds in detention. It's not just about close to home. I mean, it would be an opportunity missed for New York City not to take advantage of race to age, to kind of build a human and justice system that does what we actually have been doing very well so far, that builds on education, that builds on family supports, that builds on neighborhood interventions, to keep young people out of the human and justice system. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes we're so focused on just the kids who are moving out from one bed to another that we forget that actually what we need to do is invest in families exactly. and communities. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you for recognizing that. All right, thank you. Um, our next panel up, Beth Powers, Kate Rubin, Anthony Wells, 
Louis Padilla. That's not four there. So I want to thank you all for your commitment to serve our children and our young people who are in need of re-education, redevelopment, and just some genuine love to help them become productive adults. So thank you all for coming to today's hearing and testifying. Um, so before we, st we're going to do, f everyone's going to get four minutes. I ask you to respect the bell. Um, I understand if you're in the middle of, of an important statement, we won't pull Sam Man Sims out here and we won't you know, snatch you off the stage, but we want to just ask you to, you know, stay in respect of the time frame. So what, you know, we are here talking about a system that's catered to handle and manage and educate our, um, our young people. So I would like to start with Lewis Padilla, our young brother that's here today to have a conversation with us. So Mr. Padilla, it's on you. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lewis, and I'm a youth leader with Youth Speakers Institute. First off, I'd like to thank Chairperson Councilman King, King for hosting this oversight hearing and for the chance to testify. Today, I'll focus my testimony on why the New York City Department of Corrections correctional officers should not supervise children in ACS facilities. I'm going to focus on one specific, one, one specific reason based on my own experience. DOC correctional officers have militized, militarized training while juvenile facility staffs are trained to de-escalate and promote positive youth development. When I was 16, 16 hold on, let me just move this a little bit over there. We go. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I spent several weeks in Rikers Island. I remember one time when an inmate flooded his cell by clogging his toilet. A few correctional officers entered his cell with turtles, the emergency service unit, and the rapid response team, who are equipped with shoes, tactical gear, batons, and pepper spray. The ECS, the ESU and RRT units beat him in his cell and took him out like an animal by his arms and feet. I felt sad for him. <coughs> Still on? Oh. We can hear you. We can hear you. Oh. <laughs> good. I felt sad for him and was scared. Uh, sorry. I felt sad for him and was scared for my own safety as well. It's sad to see a child whose mind is not fully developed and who is literally crying out for attention get beaten and dragged out of his cell by adult men. Where, by adult men. Now, where's the youth development training in that? I was scared. I was scared at Rikers because I knew I could be easily misunderstood and beaten by the correctional officers with no way to hold them accountable. Furthermore, whenever there were fights, correctional officers would call the turtles, and the turtles would beat kids with their shoes and, st and sticks to stop the fights and to subdue the rest of the housing unit. After that, the kids fighting would be sent to the box solitary confinement. Now, in juvenile detention centers, fights are addressed completely different. When there was a fight in Crossroads, we would get restrained but not with shields and batons. Also, after a fight, we were not sent to solitary confinement. We were sent to speak with counselors who would who were trained youth professionals and who cared to understand what was going on with us and why we were acting the way we were. While in Crossroads, I was in many fights. I was always counseled during, the, I was always counseled. During that period, no one was visiting me, no one was there for me, but my counselor. My counselor understood that I was acting out because I was seeking attention and that my mind could not grasp all of my family dynamics at that moment. 
She provided me with coping techniques and ways to address some of my anxiety. Rikers was like a hell with no way out. I got lucky, but others suffered abuse and scars that they would never be able to recover from. We cannot have our kids in juvenile facilities open to this kind of abuse. The militarized training of the DOC will just create a new Rikers in Horizons. We need fresh staff trained to de-escalate and promote positive youth development. No problem. Thank you, thank you. Good job. Thank you, thank you. Next. Yes, Maria Gas. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to follow Lewis and just say um, thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify um, and for holding the hearing. I submitted longer written comments, so I will just summarize them briefly and say we also, you know, focused on uh, the continuum of uh, New York's juvenile justice system as it relates to three essential elements of Raise the Age implementation. The first is specialized secure detention. Yeah, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we still don't know exactly who's speaking on I'm the microphone so right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My name is Kate Rubin, and I'm the director of policy at Youth Represent. Yes. Thanks so much. Um, so the first is specialized secure detention for older youth, which uh, Lewis just spoke to, and I'll say a couple more things about that at the end. The second is the need for a robust monitoring body that includes youth, families, and community members directly impacted by Raise the Age to ensure that the implementation of the legislation meets the goal of reducing youth incarceration and arrest. Um, I know there is a very robust task force that the city has and that they're doing fantastic work. I don't know how many members of the community, how many young people, how many family members are part of that task force. Um, we go into some recommendations we have both about the makeup of it and what uh, of, of what a, an implementation task force for the city could look like and what kind of data we think is really important to collect, both from agencies and from young people themselves. Um, and then the third, which has been talked about a lot, but the need for funds for comprehensive programming, both for uh, adolescent offenders, the 16 and 17 year olds, in secure detention, um, but also for older youth who will still be at Rikers, the 18 to 24 year olds who still um, are really in need of programming and we hope that they don't lose out as part of Raise the Age. Um, just to s add a few more points on specialized secure detention uh, to what has already been said, I think the thing I really want to emphasize is that in the past five years, the city has made tremendous efforts to improve the conditions and reduce violence at Rikers, especially for youth. They've brought in some of the best progressive corrections professionals from around the country to provide technical assistance and leadership. They've put in place first-rate training. They've funded expansions in programming and legal services. They've reduced ratios of staff to youth, in some cases even to levels below required by lawsuits and settlements. And it's not enough. None of it has been enough. It hasn't changed the culture. It, I mean, and if that experience isn't enough to teach us that with tremendous effort, money, intentions, all of the best ideas, we can't change the culture at Rikers Island, and there are so many examples of documentation of the, the limitations on that progress, both from young people themselves and also, I, I really encourage everybody to read the fourth Nunez monitoring report that came out last uh, fall. I won't read from it. I think my colleagues from Legal Aid might read a little bit from it, and I included some excerpts in our testimony. Um, but it really makes clear that the problems with staff uh, continue, unabated is the word that they use, um, that the problems are not just with line staff but also with supervisors, and that, the, that all of the efforts that have been made aren't enough. And I mean, just listening to um, Deputy Commissioner Franco's testimony about all of the really incredible things that have been put in place and the much better culture in our ACS facilities. Um, I understand that there are significant operational barriers that make hiring and training ACS staff in time for an October deadline extremely difficult, but that will not be as difficult as uprooting the culture of DOC once it establishes it our, itself in our youth facilities. Correct. Correct. We are eager to support the council and the city in any way we can. Um, to develop alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. And if anyone gets happy and they want to <laughs> clap, this is how we do it. <laughs> this is how we do it. So. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. 
I'm Beth Powers. I'm the Director of Youth Justice at the Children's Defense Fund New York. Thank you so much for the opportunity to provide comments today. I've also submitted longer testimony. Um, I'm just going to hit a few talking points today. Also, thank you, Lewis, so much for, for sharing your experience. Um, so the Children's Defense Fund provides an independent voice for all children who cannot vote, lobby, or speak for themselves. And we pay particular attention to the needs of poor children, children of color, and those with disabilities. We also co-lead the Raise the Age New York campaign, a statewide advocacy effort that helped to bring attention to the need to raise the age of criminal responsibility in New York. And we continue to advocate to ensure that the law is implemented and funded in a way that ensures best outcomes for the young people who will be impacted by the law. Um, one of the most significant changes to New York City's juvenile justice system occurred with the passage of Close to Home in, in 2012, of which we heard extensively the benefits of today compared to the previous system. Um, and I'm, I'm going to skip over that and head straight into some of the Raise the Age implementation concerns. So as you know, um, in, 20, in April of 2017, legislation passed to Raise the Age. Um, and it is truly an opportunity to examine New York's juvenile justice system and ensure that front-end community-based solutions are prioritized and that deep end confinement based settings are used as a last resort. Raise the Age requires the creation of new specialized secure detention, which we've heard about extensively today, um, for adolescent offenders. And these facilities are to be uh, jointly operated by ACS and DOC. Um, one of the main points I want to make today is how alarmed we are at the city's current plan to staff these facilities with DOC staff for the first 24 months. Uh, we're concerned that staffing these facilities with DOC officers will import an adult correctional culture that will not be easily, if at all, removed after 24 months. Um, we appreciate that ACS will offer case management and programming responsibility for youth. We've heard extensively today their expertise with young people and the success they've had in decreasing detention populations and evidence-based practices and trauma-informed care. Um, however, this measure cannot negate the use of DOC staff to provide security for youth. Uh, we acknowledge the DOC has made strides to address the treatment of youth in their care, um, such as the elimination of punitive segregation for 16 to 21 year olds, an increase in positive programming for adolescents. But despite this progress, DOC is not in the best position to respond to youth and should not be tasked with overseeing 16, 17 year olds in the new youth facilities. In addition to DOC representing an adult focused approach to corrections, they have a history of mistreatment of youth, which is well documented and which we just heard from Lewis just now. Um, Raise the Age is an opportunity to genuinely change the culture that is perpetuated in DOC and transform the experiences of youth who are detained in New York. We urge the council to ensure that the benefits intended by removing youth from Rikers are not lost by allowing DOC staff and other adult correctional practices into the new youth detention facilities. And this is critical for the youth being removed from Rikers as well as the younger children in secure detention who have the potential of being exposed to this new structure. Uh, finally, we recognize that New York City faces significant potential, potential financial cuts proposed in the governor's executive budget, particularly ACS, particularly the most vulnerable children and families in New York City. Most notably, the risk of loss of state funding for close to home, a cap on child welfare preventative and protective funding, which includes juvenile justice preventative programs and aftercare, and the risk of not receiving funding at all from the state to implement Raise the Age. We can encourage the city to continue to prioritize alternatives to placement and detention as well as other innovative approaches to youth justice through close to home and the implementation of Raise the Age in this challenging fiscal environment. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, thank you. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, yes, sir. Testing one, two. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair, and, Good and thank you and Councilwoman uh, Barron for the opportunity to testify. My name is Anthony Wells. I'm the president of the Social Service Employees Union Local 371. We represent juvenile counselors, caseworkers, and social services staff, both at Rikers and at uh, uh, Juvenile Justice. Uh, once, let me also compliment uh, Commissioner Franco on his presentation and, and, and where they've come from. DJ, well, Ms. Puzak and myself, we're probably the only ones in the room uh, that were in the Department of Juvenile Justice in 1979, 1980. Ooh. Uh, we actually saw the creation of this, and we, now we see the termination of it, mm. okay, and know how this has evolved. Let me just tell you the point, uh, and we all have different issues on policy. First of all, the correctional officers speak for themselves. They don't want to be a part of this. Their president has made it very clear to the city of New York that do not, they do not want to be a part of the transition. It is the city who is insisting 
that there be a transition period. Let me be clear. I don't. Uh, I thank you for the compliment of, of for my staff. Uh, two of them in the room, Alex Parker and Doug Robinson, who were supervisors at both Crossroads and Horizons. And so we're glad to hear that our people make a difference, which is our argument in the first place. Um, we went to the city and said, you need to create a title uh, of people who want to be in this mm -hmm. program. Uh, first of all, they were held, they were given an, a test. A year is not enough. You know, so what they, my, my friend Germani said, what they've been doing, they've been working, you know, OF, OCFS had to put out their policies. Uh, their communications could be better and it's improving. But be honest with you, this is about the kids. And you need a program that's going to be in place on October 1st. And I submit to you that it will not have one. Okay, mm -hmm. the issue of even commingling, where OCFS said that these propagates can be commingling, we agree with that. They should not be commingling. Right. Okay, um, but that has not been determined as of yet. So we're trying to meet with the city. Uh, there's also some upstate, downstate mayor, governor uh, stuff going on here, uh, and it's getting in the way. Quite frankly, I've testified many places, and we need to talk about having a program. We we have we have talked to the we have uh, addressed to the governor and to the leaders up in Albany, they need to move the October 1st date back. If we're talking about the security of these young people and the security of the staff that's servicing them, then we must give it uh, appropriate time. Uh, the, there's a facility that they want to use in Brooklyn, the Mabel, what's it called, Chemistry? Ellen McCray. They didn't have, even have authority yet to use that as an intake center. Okay? Uh, once again, co-mingling, they're going to have to have a separate staff to take one population to court and another. But they're going to be in court at the same time. Right. They're going to have two different lunch periods. Right. They're going to have two different activity periods in the same facility if they co-mingle. does not make any logistical sense or security sense. But there's one place where they can co-mingle, and that's in the medical office. Now, every young person is in a gang, but if you don't think there's gang activity, you need to open your eyes up, okay, because mm -hmm. there is gang activity, okay? And guess what? Gang activity, they know how to talk to each other. You're not going to convince me that a 17-year-old gang member is not going to be able to get to a 13-year-old gang member and meet in the medical office and talk right in front of our eyes, and we don't have a clue what they're talking about. Right, right, okay? right. So there are serious security exchanges. The, the, the state has put money in. You're talking about a cost. Uh, it's $100 million that the city is not eligible for based on some property tax structure. They're not even going to get it. Also, only New York City has to remove their youth out of jails in October 1st. If you are incarcerated in Valhalla, you don't have to be moved October 1st. Okay, people don't know that. So, so though they're doing their best efforts, I'm not here to, you know, I'm not here to praise Caesar or bury Caesar, but I'm here to tell you honestly that there are serious concerns that will not allow this to be implemented in a proper in a proper form. I know I got three seconds. I'm gonna take five. Um, yeah, we got you got three more. I got three more. I appreciate that. In terms of staffing. I think the agency agrees with us. You need social service service staff uh, to provide most of these services. But there's also adequate training. Now, we can also not close our eyes. I'm not in blaming the COOs or the residents for the culture that's there, but the culture exists, mm -hmm. okay? A lot of the violence in Rikers is in between this population. And, and so we have to change the culture, too. Not just, not going to change because you put them in another building. That's true. It's not going to be overnight. Oh, we're not in Rikers anymore. Here we are. That's, that's, that's fantasy land, and Lewis can attest to that. But if you want to get to somewhere, you got to start off on a plan that is going to promote your ability to be successful. And to be successful is to change the culture, provide adequate security, provide real programs, real training programs. You know what? Bring shops back into school. I know people doing, you know, one kid may not want to do the books, but he could put together an engine. You're right. He could put together a computer. Yeah. So we need more time. And we need more time for us to be involved and all these other stakeholders to be involved. And you need to tell both of these legislatures, you guys in the state, cut it out. Let's sit down and have a real idea about how to get this done for the safety of these kids and the safety of the staff that's going to be in, this, the, in these facilities. Thank you for the opportunity. You can read my stuff. No, I, never, I never read it anyway. <laughs> thank you, President Wells. And I want to thank the panel for testifying. All of you added something to the conversation that definitely brought it back to reality. Uh, I'm glad, Deputy Commissioner, that you're still here to hear the conversation. I do ask um, when you do return back to the other side of the building that, you know, we need the adults to be in the room on this one. You know, politics, politics tend to get in the way of delivering true services for the New, York, the New Yorkers. 
So whatever you're hearing here, I'm asking you to figure out how do we take it back, put together a real strategy. And again, I'm I'm shocked to hear that I, that the city of New York is the only only city responsible with an October 1st date, and we're being pressured and rushed to deliver something that might re, that just might require a little bit more time and commitment to putting together a structure that stays that's stable. We don't want to get it done just to say we got it done. We wanted to get it done because it will last long because we got it done the right way. So whoever you're talking with back on the mayor's side, let's do this the right way. And yes, we will, as a council on this committee, we'll reach out to the speaker of the state assembly as well as the governor's office and say, hey, listen, let's do this. Let's just do it. Let's do it the right way. You know, and, and, and I think we do it the right way. You know, that you have new staff, you have new trained staff, and you won't have a correction officer. You know, and I, and I end with this. People have a uh, have the bad, bad thinking, misconception. When you call NYPD to your house because your child and you're fighting, they're not coming in to be a social worker. They're coming to defuse the situation and shut it down. And we have a bad habit of thinking when you call the police, you're going to get an ACS worker. No, you're not. You're going to get a police officer. So that's what we have here, and we got to make sure that in this transition that we have people sensitive and trained enough to manage the scenario as opposed to coming and implementing law enforcement. So I want to thank you all for your testimony. You wanted to add something, sir? Yes, you may. So yeah, basically, like, um, it, we, we working so hard to, to change the, the, the whole system, right, for the youth. So if we sit there and we take the DOC staff, right, and we move DOC, we move Rikers Island into Horizons, we working so hard for nothing. We're gonna turn Horizons to a mini Rikers Island, and all we doing is shutting down the. Ra we we basically saying we raise the age, but we still condoning Rikers Island and Horizons. So I feel like we just stop it there. Let's let's get, is, is you know let's train the, the proper people for it. That's about it. Thank you, young man. Appreciate it. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you for the panel. Thank you. Our next panel up, we have. Grant Cowles, Lisa Freeman, Julie Peterson, Giselle Castro. Okay, next panel, um, please organize. Whoever wants to go first is fine. Just introduce yourselves and. Uh. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, um, Chairman King, for giving us the opportunity to testify. My name is Lisa Freeman. I'm from the Legal Aid Society. I'm the director of the Juvenile Rights Special Litigation Unit. Um, the Legal Aid Society, as I imagine you are aware, represents the vast majority of children in the family court system, both those charged um, as juvenile delinquents as well as those whose parents are um, charged with abuse or neglect or otherwise involved with the family court. Um, we represented approximately 34,000 children last year in the family court system and approximately 1,500 children who were arrested um, as juvenile delinquents. Um, in addition to our juvenile rights practice, we also have the criminal defense practice. Um, and as part of that criminal defense practice, um, we have an adolescent intervention and diversion practice, the head of which is Nancy Ginsburg, who is sitting with me here, um, which handles the cases that were discussed earlier of juvenile offenders who are young people ages 13 to 15 generally who are charged in as adults in the criminal court system. And that will not change with Racy Age. Those, uh, the juvenile offender laws were not altered in any way by the Racy Age um, legislation. So uh, first I want to um, uh, 
uh, recognize the comment that you made earlier that we have to um, be very cognizant of who the population is that we're talking about and that the vast majority of children in the juvenile justice system are black, brown, minority um, children and that that's um, you know, completely inappropriate and really an intrusion upon those communities in the vast majority um, of, of the time. It, they're completely overrepresented in our system. They're also disproportionately um, members of the LGBTQ community also that are uh, over-policed and runaway and homeless youth in New York City are also disproportionately represented in the system. We, um, we commend the city for the incredible reforms that have taken place in the last um, several years and Commissioner Franco spoke to many of them. And one of the points I would like to make at the outset is um, a point that he made at the very end of his testimony, which is that we should not only be focused on youth who are in detention and in placement, and that the juvenile justice system provides um, a whole host of benefits, and, and that that's the goal of the Raise the Age is to offer those benefits to an older population, who frankly should have been included in the juvenile justice system long ago. So I'm very concerned at the suggestion that we should somehow delay implementation of Raise the Age or delay taking 16 to 17 year olds off Rikers Island. Um, New, York New York State was one of only two states in the country that continued to treat all 16 year olds as adults and the fact that we finally got that legislation passed I think is um, way overdue and that we should absolutely not delay that implementation and that we, we should rather accelerate and focus our efforts on making sure that it's implemented effectively. Um, but that by no means should we consider delaying that implementation. Um, I also think that the concerns that have been expressed about the Department of Correction in um, their role in the SSDs is, um, is deeply, deeply troubling. The Legal Aid Society is the, um, has brought those lawsuits, the Nunez litigation on Rikers Island, and while we absolutely think it has brought some improvement to Rikers Island, it by no means um, has brought the kind of improvement that we would hope and certainly has not provided, I will finish up, it has certainly not provided the kind of change in attitude towards that population that we would then want to bring over to the juvenile justice system. I also would just add that the educational benefits of close to home have been enormous, but that there is still room for improvement that the mayor had a task force that issued a, a series of recommendations to address this population because the problem of the school to prison pipeline is a real one and that those um, recommendations need to be implemented. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Julie Peterson. I am a senior program officer at the Pinkerton Foundation and I also co-chair the New York Youth Justice Initiative, which is a group of funders concerned about youth justice in New York City. I had the privilege of testifying before the City Council on these issues in December. I want to say that Pinkerton funds after-school programs for young people in New York City, and it also focuses on programs for young people involved in the criminal justice and child welfare systems. And we applaud New York's efforts to raise the age of criminal court jurisdiction, and we would absolutely speak against any delay in moving 16 and 17 year olds off of Rikers Island. As my colleague said, we have waited long enough for the age to be raised in New York. Today I bring my voice to bear on two important issues. The first is the importance of supportive youth programming for all youth in the juvenile and criminal systems. It's imperative as the age is raised to support transformational programming based in positive youth development for young adults both within and without incarcerative settings. Youth need programs and people around them that believe in them and inspire hope for their future. In the last few years, the Administration for Children's Services, the Departments of Corrections and Probation, and the Department of Youth and Community Services have made efforts to improve programming for justice-involved youth, and Pinkerton supports many of these programs. 
As the age of criminal court jurisdiction is raised, the city must support increased programming for the 16 and 17-year-olds in ACS facilities as well as robust programming for the 18 to 24-year-olds that will remain on Rikers Island. The second issue I wish to address concerns the administration's plans to use DOC staff at ACS juvenile facilities. On February 6th of this year, 35 foundations signed a letter to the administration urging them to reconsider these plans. I speak today on behalf of these funders when I say that we believe these plans are misguided and dangerous for young people. There's a clear and well-documented history of children being ex uh, subjected to unacceptable abusive conditions on Rikers Island. We've heard a lot of testimony to that today. Using DOC staff at ACS facilities for even two years leaves young people in harm's way. It also has the real potential to import the well-documented culture of violence and corruption at Rikers to the city's youth facilities. The legislature did not mandate 16 and 17 year olds off Rikers Island because of the condition of the facilities. Rather, they acted precisely because of the culture of violence that exists there. We urge the city council to stand with us and act to prevent the use of DOC staff in ACS facilities. And I speak for the funder community when I say that we are eager to partner with the city to help find alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Grant Coles. I'm the Senior Policy and Advocacy Associate for Youth Justice at Citizens Committee for Children. CCC is an independent multi-issue child advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. CCC does not accept government funds or provide services. We just advocate on behalf of kids. Um, thanks for holding today's hearing. And um, there's just two, our, our full remarks provide, our full testimony provides a lot more remarks, but I'll summarize with two points. Um, the first being the DOC issue in, in ACS facilities, and the second being the state budget cuts. Um, so CCC agrees with uh, the, the consensus in the room, it seems like that to urge the city council to strongly oppose the city's plan to use staff ACS secure detention facilities with DOC staff. Um, as mentioned, there's been uh, a lot of uh, evidence about the culture of violence and how uh, sticky that culture is and how moving buildings um, cannot adequately address that. Um, we absolutely want to emphasize and commend ACS for the major reforms and new initiatives um, that have been have fundamentally improved the juvenile justice system. Um, as mentioned today, the, the great programs and services that have benefited the kids that are in the secure detention facilities are tremendous improvements, and it's precisely because of those improvements and that um, beneficial treatment that's um, taken root there that we do, don't want to see that taken a step backwards with the introduction of adult correctional staff. Um, so though we uh, absolutely want to see this uh, addressed and, no, and no, DOC, COC, no DOC staff used in juvenile detention facilities, in the event that if, it, if, if they are used nonetheless, we have some recommendations. Um, first, that CCC strongly recommends that every precaution is taken to ameliorate the threats that DOC staff might have on the juveniles. Um, we recommend that no DOC staff be permitted to come in contact with youth under 16 or any non-DOC uh, youth, supervised youth under aid and circumstances, so essentially the no, com no commingling. Um, we also recommend that a selection process be used that identifies DOC staff that have a true interest and ability to work with youth, and the selection process does not only consider seniority. Um, CCC recommends that the selection process needs to begin immediately so that the staff coming to Horizons can receive that extensive training. The staff need to learn ways to interact with youth that doesn't include um, Rikers type uh, tactics such as using pepper spray or handcuffing youth to, to desks. Um, they, we encourage them to learn about the entire philosophy and background of adolescent development and juvenile justice best practices, including things such as trauma-informed care. And so finally, turning to the second point about the state budget cuts, um, as mentioned on the prior panel, these are serious uh, financial cuts being threatened to the juvenile justice continuum in New York City. Um, there's kind of three big ones. The access to raise the age funding, that's $100 million that New York City's not going to have any access to. Um, the second one is the close-to-home funding cuts. The 
state budget uh, proposes reauthorizing Close to Home Initiative, but cuts all $41.4 million of state funding. Uh, the Close to Home is going to be needed for the existing youth, and now it's going to be even needed also to the new youth of 16 to 17 year olds into this population. Um, it seems entirely counterintuitive to be cutting the program that's, uh, that's now needing to grow. And the third, as mentioned, is the child welfare and services cut. These programs provide uh, preventative services, like such as alternative to detention, alternative to placement programs. I'm talking about the importance of the juvenile system as being those set of, ser of services and programs beyond just simply the, the facilities of detention and placement facilities, but it's this whole continuum of programs. Many of them are funded by this child welfare services funding. And so this cut, which is expected to be $67 million in the first year, um, is going to be really traumatic for this juvenile justice continuum. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Giselle Castro. I'm the executive director of It's Love Youth. Thank you, Chair, for having us this afternoon to speak on a very important issue. We work with young people who are court involved in New York City, ages 15 to 19, and we do understand that young people who are released from Rikers Island or sometimes even the detention facilities, they come in with added trauma. And we are also, we agree that DOC should not be having any oversight or creating or pe perpetuating a system that we're trying so hard to change. At our organization, you know, one of our biggest principles and philosophy is to humanize and to validate and to inspire our youth. We do this through a structure that is an educational internship model, but with a curriculum that is culturally relevant. And one of, one of our biggest strengths is our ability to collaborate with so many people who have been really fighting the good fight for so many years. We get referrals from the Department of Probation, from ACS, we work with Legal Aid, we Brooklyn Defenders you name the person, I think that we are involved. It is one of the most critical times, I think, in our era. And the last thing that I want to say, because we testify as well um, in December, it's a real opportunity. And at Exalt, we have been able to serve many young people. Our data um, is really encouraging. We have over 15 and 16 and 17 year old youth who are in school. We have been able to, particularly in Brooklyn, have the DA's office reduce sentences, and this to me is really important and critical uh, because we then have our youth gain the opportunity to go, to go to college. It really is an opportunity to give them access to life. I want to close out, you know, once again by thank you, thanking all of you, thanking you for listening to all of us, our concerns, and Exalt is hopefully one of the group of people or partners that will be able to help in this critical time. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, I do have a question too. So the first one's to you, uh, Ms. Giselle mm -hmm. Castro from Exalt. Um, you say you help and you get referrals. Um, what is the capacity of the number of people that your program can handle? That's an excellent question. Um, currently, we serve 180 young people, brand new to the organization. We wow. just endorsed the scaling plan to serve more young people. We know that there's a big need in terms of young people being referred to us. Um, our capacity at this point is limited. Um, it is because of funding, you know, which is our inherent challenge, I think, for every single nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. um, and our goal is to serve more young people. What is the success rate of the students that come into your program mm -hmm. and go out and never return back to the, to the system? Sure. Uh, that's a great question as well. At this point, it's 68% of our success rate. Um, and at currently, for two years out, less than 5% of our kids are reconvicted of a crime. Um, we will say that a lot of the great work, it is in our partnership. Uh, for instance, we have you know, one of our internship partners, the Children's Defense Funds. Mm -hmm. We are very careful and thoughtful with who we partner our youth and ensuring that they have a plan. You know, so there's a lot of rigor um, you know, to this and accountability and a lot of thought. Um, I would say that the other aspect in terms of what makes our organization or the experience that we give our kids um, significant to them is that we give language to their to their experience. You know, their week one in the curriculum is the school to prison pipeline, mass incarceration, the challenges on race in this country, and all of this like really helps a young person begin to take you know what we always want them to do, which is ownership, which is a big challenge I think you know for even adults. Okay, well uh, I thank you for the, that answer, that El Grant or Lisa either one. Um, 
Right now, do you know what is the number of 16 and 17 year olds on Rikers that uh, October 1st goes as well as October 1st? I know you, sp you know what that number looks like that will transition out of Rikers into the New York City system? I think we think it's about 135. 135. Right. And I just wanted to clarify. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify my answer earlier on one point, which is with regard to the commingling. The um, the union president was talking about you know older kids influencing younger kids. We actually support commingling because ACS already is managing a population that includes kids up through 18. Just because you know it, at the moment in detention they only have children and, and placement children who were arrested for something that took place prior to their 16th birthday but they may well stay in um, their custody uh, through the age of 18 and so they already are dealing with that issue and and it seems to us that the question is really that they need to have you know a strong classification system because otherwise what will happen is it will be impossible for them to really provide the kind of programming to the whole population that that needs to be provided so that's that's our concern okay. I thank you for that um, and I, I do understand the difference of co-mingling um, in the positive sense of someone who can be a mentor and someone who's co-mingling to organize disaster and I think that's where President Wells was going because if you are a gang member and you're not in, in, uh, in the, uh, in the business of empowering the 13 year old, you're empowering them to destruction. They know you gotta manage that conversation and gotta realize what that population looks like when you get them in the room. Of course you can get a 17 year old who got it together, who's been there, like you said, use your turn, who might have been in the system for a while, who's turned stuff around. Mm -hmm. Then yeah, that's a person that you can, you can co-mingle, but if your whole population is where you have not been able to identify the strengths and weaknesses, then you might create more chaos in that environment than protect an environment. Right, absolutely. But I think the question that they're addressing is whether the 16 and 17 year olds that are coming in um, as adolescent offenders can be commingled with, with comparable, I mean, with comparable 16 and 17 year olds in ACS custody, with JDs already in the custody, in NJOs in their custody. So it's not necessarily, I think they already separate out by age mm -hmm. based on their classification system. Well, this conversation shall be continued and we will look forward to helping our young people be greater young people. So thank you, panel, for being here and thank for all your information so today. Much. Thank you. Our next panel up is dun, 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 Alyssa Pramone, Karen Thor, Lessa, is it Thor Lessa or, or is Karen Thor? Where's Thor? Hey, Thor, all right, we got Thors in the house. And Sophia Morell. Um, okay, so we have Thor and Perone. What's the first name? Alyssa. Alyssa. All right. So we have room for two more. So if Lisette Nieves, Lisette, come on up, Lisette, and Gabrielle Pienso, did I say it right? Uh, oh, Prisco. Oh, it must be the ink. Someone ran out of ink on the paper. Well, at any given moment, the four of you, do your thing. Uh, Press, you see a little oh, red light? There we go. There you go. <laughs> okay. Go on here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Alyssa Perone. I'm a staff attorney uh, with the School Justice Project at Advocates for Children of New York, where I provide educational advocacy and legal representation for youth who are involved or at risk of being involved with the juvenile or criminal justice systems. And my testimony focuses on the educational needs, as you had brought up earlier, um, of New York City's court-involved youth while they're in juvenile detention and placement and while they return from those settings. Um, 
So as you probably know, court involved youth are an extremely vulnerable population of students in New York City and nationally. Many of our court involved students have complex educational and mental health needs that have been inadequately addressed prior to their arrest. Um, over half of all court involved youth are students with disabilities. Um, and many are overage and undercredited and performing far below grade level. Um, in fact, 94% um, of youth in juvenile detention are, re are reading below grade level and 40% of youth are reading below a fourth grade reading level. Um, so this data clearly demonstrates the need in all settings for high quality education and social emotional supports that are individually tailored to address the unique and complex needs of the students that they serve. Um, so with that goal, we make some recommendations longer in uh, the written testimony from the mayor's leadership team on school climate and discipline um, for, for these youth. So first, we strongly s recommend that all facilities serving court-involved youth provide a safe and supportive environment. Um, and towards that end, we strongly recommend that juvenile facilities be staffed by ACS, as we've heard here today, rather than the Department of Corrections, and that all staff um, working with, with youth be trained in therapeutic crisis intervention and other evidence-based techniques to enable them to safely and appropriately address the behavioral needs of students in their care. Um, second, because most court-involved youth enter the facilities performing well below grade level, we strongly recommend facilities provide intensive research-based remediation services. Um, and extend schooling to 12 months to help students catch up academically. Um, and the data and our experience also reflect the continued need to improve educational transition planning for students leaving juvenile detention and placement to ensure that youth stay engaged in education and to reduce the likelihood of recidivism. So we strongly recommend that ACS, the Department of Education, and provider staff collaborate with the family well in advance of a student's release from the facility to determine an appropriate educational setting and supports upon their release, and then to follow up for several months afterwards. Um, fourth, since court-involved youth often have long histories of disengagement from school, it's imperative that schools educating a disproportionate number of court-involved students receive systemic supports to meet the high needs of those schools. So we call on the city council to urge the mayor to include the following funding in the fiscal year 2019 executive budget. Um, $2.875 million per year for direct mental health supports and services for students using a medical model with coordination between schools and mental health providers as an evidence-based alternative to disciplinary action in 20 high-need schools in Brooklyn and the Bronx, and a million per year for whole school training and support for school staff in high-need schools using the evidence-based model of collaborative problem solving to help students with significant behavioral challenges and the staff that support them to resolve those problems in a skill-building and collaborative way. So we look forward to working with you to ensure that court-involved students are provided quality education in court-ordered settings and upon their release. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Thor Lesser, and I'm here representing the Prospect Hill Foundation. The Prospect Hill Foundation is a New York-based philanthropy founded by the Beinecke family more than 50 years ago. We promote the leadership of formerly incarcerated youth and their families and a concept of justice that advances rehabilitation. In December, we spoke at the committee's last hearing on Raise the Age. Since that time, we have become increasingly concerned about two main issues related to the implementation of Raise the Age. First, it is important to remember that 16 and 17 year olds are children and should be treated as such. Juvenile facilities must be staffed exclusively by individuals focused on a rehabilitative approach. The United States government and the general public accept that children require different treatment with regards to things like smoking, enlisting in the military, and voting. We should also recognize that children require different treatment by detention and prison staff. Therefore, like Councilman Torres and virtually everyone in this room, we strongly object to having the staff of the New York City Department of Correction inside New York detention facilities for 16 and 17 year olds. While the mission of ACS is to serve children, the mission of DOC is custody and control. The presence of DOC staff will bring the same harmful practices and abusive culture from the adult facilities on Rikers into Ellen McQueen, Horizon, and Crossroads. Young adults who have spent time on Rikers also attest to the stark differences between their treatment by DOC staff and the more understanding treatment they receive from ACS staff. 
like Lewis. Second, in keeping with the spirit of Raise the Age, we strongly urge the city to expand funding for programs for 16 and 17 year olds. The Prospect Hill Foundation is fully committed to supporting the city's efforts to implement Raise the Age. We will continue to fund advocacy efforts and community-based alternatives, but the city must also do its part to make new funds available through ACS, DOE, and DYCD to expand programs for youth. Empirical and anecdotal evidence from formerly incarcerated youth shows there are many excellent cost-effective community-based programs in New York City, such as the ones here today, like Community Connections for Youth, Lineage Project, Exalt Youth, and Youth Speakers Institute. And those programs can reduce recidivism while supporting youth in education and employment. However, it is simply impossible for these programs to serve substantially more people without a commensurate increase in funding. These organizations must receive expanded contracts and funding as part of the city's commitment to improving the way youth are served while they are detained and incarcerated. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Is this on? Okay, hi. Good afternoon. My name is Lisette Nieves. I am the de Deputy Director of Programs at Community Connections for Youth. Um, and we are a organization whose mission is to empower grassroots faith and neighborhood organizations to develop effective community-driven alternatives to incarceration for youth. And while we are grateful for the Raise the Age legislation, let's be clear that our stance as an organization is that we believe in no kids in cages. Um, United States disproportionately incarcerates children at a capacity that is just ridiculous. Um, if we, we've had um, interns that come from, you know, Germany and Belgium and a young person who commits a crime at the age of 14 is not incarcerated, they are provided with services. Imagine that um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a different reality. But you know, within the confines of Raise the Age, um, we are vehemently opposed to having Department of Correction staff transplanted from Rikers to Horizon. We are transplanting a culture um, that exists at Rikers. It's real, it's, it's been documented. Um, and we have worked very closely with ACS to partner um, with the facility to, to transform the culture. We are in the intake unit when young people come in. Um, and these are not hardened criminals. We, you know, we have 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds who come in crying because they don't want to be in jail. Um, so, um, you know, that doesn't change when they, auto it doesn't automatically change when they turn 16, 17. Um, they, like, like our previous panelists said, they are still children. Um, you know, we are vehemently opposed. Uh, and there shouldn't be, you know, I think one of the council members was alluding to the fact that there is bureaucracy that's getting in the way of, you know, this transition. And they're not focusing on who they need to focus on is the children. Um, so, you know, it is clear that Department of Correction staff are not equipped to work with children. Um, so we are vehemently opposed to that. And the other point that I want to address is that there needs to be more community involvement in this discussion. Um, there needs to be community members. There needs to be young people, families that are impacted by the justice system who are on every task force. Um, there need to be conversations. And CCFY is committed to facilitating those conversations where we have the stakeholders and the representatives, the judges, you know, the city council people, the ACS workers, everyone who's involved in making these changes to involve the community to hear our concerns. I think this hearing is a good first step, but there needs to be more community conversations where the people who are impacted this at the front line, which is our young people, our families, need to be part of this conversation. Agreed. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gabrielle Prisco. I'm the executive director of Lineage Project. I want to thank the committee and its leadership for this opportunity to testify. I want to begin by reading a poem by a young man named Juan. It was written while he was detained at Horizon Juvenile Center. It's called Karma. Karma always knocks on your door. Kill him today and you close in the door. They curse their birth for fabrication. I make a line of separation. You care for clothes? I walk in horizon rags in desperation. It sickened me their brain is mold, a younger body, mind of gold. Prepare for the future, Jew, untold. Lineage Project brings mindfulness programs to incarcerated, homeless, and academically vulnerable youth to help them manage stress, build inner strength, and cultivate compassion. 
We also work with the frontline staff of youth serving organizations. We also lead Sonic Horizon, which is a groundbreaking arts and mindfulness after school program for young people detained at Horizon. It's funded by DYCD. Under this contract, we provide 12 plus hours of weekly programming serving about 300 youth a year. And we subcontract with 10 or more community-based organizations and consulting to provide arts and mentorship like from community connections from youth. And we provide our own mindfulness classes. We bring kids drama, poetry, beat making, filmmaking, and a whole range of beautiful and life-changing programs that you can read more about in our testimony. I'm here today because as you've heard from other panelists, to the best of our knowledge, the city has not increased funding for programs for youth in the justice system, despite that the fact that the population is set to exponentially increase on October 1st. Given the raise the age legislation and the mandate of moving kids off Rikers, it's our understanding that by about October 1st, Horizon will be at capacity, which is roughly 106 young people, which is an approximate 341% change from the current approximate rough census of 24. The census varies at, at any time. I just want to repeat that. It's an approximate 341% change. Yet our contract, for example, and those of other providers have not been set to increase. In addition to the dramatic increase just in the number of youth, a 341% increase, the programming must expand to meet the diverse needs of the new populations. Because of the legislative changes, as you know, that young people um, being charged as adolescent offenders, young people charged with juvenile offenses, young people charged with juvenile delinquencies, young people coming off of Rikers, kids of very different ages and experience and socio-emotional uh, learning, literacy levels, developmental stages, and it's critical that providers have funding to tailor programming to all of these needs. Um, in addition, we've also heard about the New York State regulations, which are going to set limits on which kids can and cannot be programmed together, and that too will require that there be an expansive amount of programming to stay within compliance with the regulations. You know, it's just incredibly concerning that programming, which really should be central to the creation of a system, not an afterthought. Again, to the best of my knowledge, there have been no contracts released um, to offer programming to the young people once they come into place. The contracts that are in place, to the best of my knowledge, have not been increased. Um, and programming provides a myriad of critical educational, social, psychological benefits. It may reduce recidivism, and also programming reduces idle time, which is a well-established contributor to incidents in youth-serving institutions. As the city prepares to engage in what is a historical transformation, and one that many of us in this room have fought for many years to have these things happen, so I really want to be clear that we support these, this transformation, but it must be done in a planful way with regard to thinking about young people's needs about their development about the programmatic needs beyond that of just containment and custody so i have five recommendations that i'm going to say very quickly because i heard the bell the first is that programming be a central part of the city's planning process the second is that the local community-based organizations that provide these essential services be at the planning table to help design programs to serve young people along with the families and community stakeholders that lizette spoke about the third is that robust funds are allocated to programs for all youth in the justice system, including the kids moving off of Rikers and the 16 and 17 year olds. The fourth is that meaningful and effective programming be tailored to the unique needs of the populations within the city's justice system and we don't have a one size fits all approach. And the fifth is that programming is offered with enough frequency so that all eligible young people can routinely participate. And I could tell you right now that when we have incidents inside the facility, it can be because young people feel that they're unfairly being denied programming that their peers have access to. And I, in conclusion, I just also want to echo my colleagues' concerns around not delaying the process of moving kids off Rikers and on the Department of Corrections staffing, um, all of the very serious concerns that have been raised around the Department of Correction culture and institution and the real brutal torture that has happened on Rikers Island and ensuring that that isn't replicated in the youth justice system. Thank you. Uh, I thank you all for your testimony. I do have a comment question. And as I'm hearing a number of folks saying about uh, we need to make sure whatever we put in place is stable. I'm also hearing that uh, we can't delay. Um, I'm not sure if delaying is the answer, uh, but if we're going to do this and if we're going to be one of the first, the, 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 matter of fact, we will be the first biggest, largest city to do this. 
then we have to be an example of getting it right. So I'm saying to each and all of us who are saying don't delay, don't delay, uh, like I say, I'm not advocating delay, but I want to make sure whatever we establish that it makes sense because we're talking about five months out, and you just brought to the table that there are questions about programming that hasn't even been brought to the table. They're still trying to figure out how they're going to staff this. They're still trying to figure out routes. You know, they're still trying to figure out locations. In five months, that's a lot of work to get done. And I'm just saying, you know, sometimes we can put pen to paper and say, let's do it, let's do it. But how realistic can we do something in the amount of time that's given? Whatever they've done in the last year or haven't done is having an impact on it's going to have an impact on the next five months. So while we're here advocating for it to get it done, get it, get it done, we just have to make sure that when it does get done, that those young people that walk into the door don't get so discouraged that they go into another frenzy and then we have a whole host of new, new issues that we have to deal with because we didn't have the system stable enough when they walked in the door. Now they see a brighter light than from the darkness that they just came out of. So I wanted to give you that because I'm hearing what you're saying and I want you to be a part, helping us continue to, helping the city figure this out. And when we do have the conversation specifically on raised age, I'm looking forward to seeing all of your faces again and many, 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 many more. So thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. And the last of the Mohegans is Jeanette Bocanegra. How are you? Good to see you. I, I feel like I need more than four minutes, so I'm going to sit in each chair. <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what, i give you seven. Thank you. <laughs> I said, I think I, I spoke enough since 2010 when my youngest son introduced me to the system. Mm. So I, I had to bring the voice of a, of a parent. I am here also as a director of family engagement for Community Connections for Youth. Um, and if you look at our website, we were able to create a strong family engagement portfolio um, for the families that have been impacted by the juvenile justice system, the criminal justice system, the child welfare system. I came in as a lost parent, not understanding the language. Even though I did a, m much community work, worked for a nonprofit organization working with families in the public school, I was able to help parents, train parents, parent coordinators, members of a school leadership team, help parents understand IEPs, I understood that. But when my youngest son out of six introduced me to the system, the first thing I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed because it was not something in my home. And, but I was hungry to learn while sitting at, at Horizon, who's working with families understand this system. If I speak two languages and I'm lost, I could just imagine a parent that only speaks Spanish or a, an Af a parent from Africa that doesn't speak English. So I, I decided to make this my passion, to, to work with families. Children don't need to be locked up. Opportunities, and you know, we, we heard questions about what's going on with education. We're not funding public schools properly. I heard about mental health, the wellness of a young person. There's no consistency when a young person returns from placement um, to follow up. Um, Rikers became a nightmare when I had to step my foot into Rikers. I felt like I committed a crime. Mm. And speaking about closing facilities upstate, which close to home came very strong. I was part of close to home. Raising the age, I spoke about the things that were happening to young people on the cu in the custody of, of adults that are supposed to care for them. But if I do those things that are being done to these kids in Rikers, I'll be arrested for child abuse. When going upstate to talk about raise the age, we, I heard folks that profit from the prison system and their jobs are keeping our kids locked up because let's, let's keep it real. The kids that are being locked up are the kids that look like us. Children across borders commit the same mistakes but they don't treat th those kids the same way as they treat our kids. So let's, mm -hmm. let's be real. True that. Racism exists. Yes, it is. And I heard those folks saying, well, are we going to send these gup, um, are we going to put the sharks with the guppies? And I said, you didn't think about putting the guppies with the sharks when you sent our kids 
to the adult system. Mm -hmm. And the more families that I work with and the more young people that I support and even visit in facilities, they have no business in there. I think I've been very fortunate that at one point I got to work with everyone that spoke at all these at, in all these groups. Gabrielle, what you're doing, amazing. Continue doing the work. Don't give up on our kids. Beth, like I could go on and go on. Like everyone here, I want to thank you for embracing me and learning about this work. And it became a passion for me. Councilman King, it is your responsibility to make sure that our kids are better today than they were yesterday. Councilmember Jamal spoke about the system is doing what it was created to do. So we need to demolish this. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the beep, that was just me. Mm -hmm. The system is doing exactly what it was created to do. Right. And I learned that it was, it's a modern day slavery because they take away so many rights from our young people and families. Families care about their kids, but families feel also like there's so many systems that are not really supporting them. We need to build stronger communities, support families, and it's really about the money. Invest in our communities. E every time I walk out the door, all I see is the deli, the chicken spot, the beauty salon, the nail salon, the check cashing place, the liquor store. Mm -hmm. You walk another block, it's the same business. I wanna see more, I wanna see yoga programs in my community. I wanna see art centers in my community. I wanna see youth groups in my community. I want to see some of your young people coming and mentoring our young people. This can be done, yes, it can. but it's also about the money. Put some of that money back in the community. Invest in our kids and our families. I always say you can't help the kid unless you support the family. You can't support the family unless you're embracing the kid. So I think I, I, I'm seeing that, that blink. Oh, it's not blinking. Thank you for not cutting me off. But we also have families here that have been impacted by the criminal justice system, and their kids have no business being locked up. They need to be in a school, learning, a trade, or ready to go to college. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, what a way to close out um, our first hearing on the Juvenile Justice mm -hmm. Committee. For 2018, I want to thank everyone who came out today to educate each other and educate the public and those who are watching on TV um, of what we're talking about, how we're going to improve the lives. More importantly, correct a system that does have a lot of flaws, and we need to make sure that we hold, you know, hold them to the fire and let them know that we won't tolerate the missteps and the mishaps, but cor stand together, united, to correct those mishaps to save a life, you know, to save a family. So. You have a commitment from this committee that we will do all that we can to have the right conversation and the real conversation, as, as difficult as it might be uh, and uncomfortable for some others. But in order for us to uh, recover, we got to uncover it first. So I thank you all for coming out today, and this adjourns our first committee meeting on justice. On our justice. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>